Come on in here. Come on in here, y'all. This is a Twitter space. So for those of you listening later on YouTube, this is a Twitter space. Twitter spaces get off to a slower start because we need people to join. I'm a co-host here, Eve. What's up? Breeze, New Black Media. Nicey girl. I'm out here in a study in extremely hot Palm Springs. It's where it is now has cooled down to about 83 degrees at night. So welcome, y'all. Welcome. Mm. Mm, here we go. Welcome, everybody. Well, anyway, we're talking about um, we're talking about the uh, there was a post on Instagram where um, Pete Rock and I give him the credit of saying the legendary hip hop producer. I'm not gonna take away from what he's done musically and slight him any way, shape, or form. Because we could tear his ass down and his statements down without tearing him down. That's what I'm about. We could tear down what he said. We could tear down all of these uh, people who say hip-hop is anything other than black American. We could tear their arguments down without tearing them down. I don't think Pete Rock has been a, di a disrespectful like prick like like uh, Fat Joe. Now, we can we can choose to tear Fat Joe down all we want because... By the way, he moving. You know, he don't deserve much respect. But uh, as far as Pete Rock goes, I'm not going to tear him down. But I will tear down what he said. And for those of you who don't know, then somebody can post it on Instagram. And I got this from Nicey Girl's co-host, Sincere. Hopefully it's not too late on the East Coast for Sincere to join. I meant to, I meant to do this space way earlier. But like I said, I'm in Palm Springs having a good-ass time. Shit. <laughs> I tried, I tried, I tried. But we um but it was because a sincere inboxed me that uh that post this morning. The first thing I saw. And I said, Oh hell no. We gotta do a Twitter space on this. And so uh so he po Pete Rock posted a trailer of Tariq's documentary coming out and said that basically called the trailer cap and he was saying that he can that hip the founders of hip hop 70% of them he later on said in the comments were Jamaican so I want to first break that down and then break down a bigger point of view is, is what he's talking about and also you guys know that Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Eve, for putting that post he put up there. Oh, damn. Funny how time works. That was two years ago. This week that he put up that post. If hip-hop didn't come from Jamaica, then tell me why so many Jamaicans aren't hip-hop. Y'all think we're here for nothing. And it's funny, he put Ras Clot in the, in the tweet, but I never heard Ras Clot in a song. Pete Rock. I ain't gonna put Rasaclot in a tweet, but you ain't never put Rasaclot in not one of your goddamn songs you produce, huh? To answer your question, P. Rock, if hip hop didn't come from Jamaica, then tell me why so many Jamaicans are in hip hop? Because a lot of Jamaicans live in New York, and it's only New York Jamaicans that are in hip hop. There are no Calif there are no L. A. Jamaicans in hip hop. I know we got Jamaicans out here because we used to. I don't know why when I used to hoop, I don't know about y'all, but here on the West Coast, the Jamaicans always used to hoop at the same park, but them niggas would either play cricket, and when they did play basketball, they was on a different court. They'd have their own little Jamaican court, and niggas would not go hoop with the Jamaicans because them niggas fouled too goddamn hard, and they couldn't play worth a, worth a goddamn. You get injured trying to hoop with them Jamaicans. So we've had Jamaicans out here. Why? Where are the Jamaican hip-hop scene in L.A.? In 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 DC, 
in Buffalo, New York, in Philadelphia. The reason why so many Jamaicans are in hip hop because a large concentration of Jamaicans were sent to a black American enclave and they were immersed in black American culture. And the black American culture was so goddamn good, so funky, so sweet, so dope. You said, fuck my rice clad bumper clock culture. And I'm going to do what them black Americans are doing. That's why you in hip hop. So we're going to start off by saying that. And we're going to get to y'all comments. I, I'm going, I did the Twitter space because I want to hear what y'all got to say. I did a YouTube show earlier when I want to dominate the conversation. Well, I'm still going to dominate the conversation because I talk a goddamn lot. But I still want to hear what y'all got to say. Uh, that's why we're doing this. I see Twizzle out there. But I want to say first welcome to my co-host, Jess Eve. And then I'm going to hear what you got to say. And then we're going to move on. <laughs> peace in the room. Peace to one. Um, yeah. Look, so these conversations, I'm normally not going to have much to say. Obviously, I'm not an authority on all things hip hop. But what I do know is that a lot of these niggas from New York are not from here. And they've been cosplaying as us. <laughs> Real quick, you're an expert on all things black culture, so you're an expert on this conversation, but go ahead. Thank you for that. Uh, look, a lot of them are not from here. They've been cosplaying as us for a very long time. And our family in New York, they 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 get so offended when we say that because I guess they don't like to know that they've been replaced by people who are not from here. Um, I read an article today where... Pete Rock actually says that the pioneers are Marley Marl, Teddy Riley, 45 King, and Larry Smith. And from the two seconds of Google research that I did, those are all foundational Black Americans. So back in January mm -hmm. 2020, he was speaking the truth. And then I guess he decided that it's okay to embellish. So I don't know. I think that us delineating right now has always been a reason for them to jump out and play in traffic. But, you know, um, maybe there's something I'm missing. Uh, a lot of them are related. You know, Heavy D is his cousin. Uh, you got a lot of people who don't necessarily know that these connections are familial. And then you're trying to figure out, well, why can't we get in the game? And it's because they're playing by other rules, you know, nepotism and such. So... I guess we can start there. Yeah, that's a good way to start. Appreciate that. Um, Eve, if you can't my website in the Jumbotron, dewanb.com. Yeah, and I got my documentary. It's bigger than hip hop, the Black American Music Family Tree. I need y'all help. Uh, donate to the GoFundMe. And also, I need you guys to get the live stream pay per view. I already have the, the short, the full first uh, do documentary already filmed and ready to go. And we're doing a watch party together Sunday, November 12th. Where, and that's going to be the live stream premiere, extended version, extended cut of It's Bigger Than Hip Hop. So we already filmed. Um, what I need you guys' help with is to get the full series. But the full, uh, the first full, first, the first full, uh, the installment is already done. And by purchasing a pass to the watch party, and you get you not only get to watch the extended version that's not going to be available on YouTube, the shorter version is going to be available on YouTube, but you get the extended version, you keep your copy, and it's a QA. Um, it's a QA. And what you're doing is you're funding with your admission. You're funding the full series. That's what you're doing. So you get to keep your copy of it. You get to fund the full series. And after we watch it, you get to ask questions. And I'm answering your questions because you know me. I'm here. Y'all don't know me. Like, like y'all know me from here. But, you know, I don't have a college professorship. I'm not somebody from a major university. I haven't been on everybody's TV show. So I want to prove myself by standing up to everything that I say. And that's my get down. I'll show it to you and then sit there and ask whatever questions, take whatever critiques and criticism, 
and clear up any confusion because the whole point is to teach things straight. So I stand behind everything I say. And so having the live stream Q and a allows people to watch it and ask me questions on the spot that they may have some misconceptions about. So that's what the whole documentary series is about. All right. A bit, but back to this nigga Pete Rock. So Pete Rock says 70% of the founders are Jamaican. What I'm trying to figure out is what does he mean by founders? Who? 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 Like, these people think just because they're rapping, let me tell you what it is. And I had this conversation with a friend of mine that's uh, from Trinidad. Uh, and he immigrated to Washington, D.C. in the early 80s. And I was telling him what Pete Rock and Fat Joe have been saying, because he ain't been paying attention to this whole thing. He's like, what do you mean, hip-hop? He's like, hip-hop ain't Caribbean. He said, man, and I'm going to have him in my in my documentary, my man Mark Prince. He's a comedian. Y'all probably seen him on 5150. He's been on a lot of stuff. Um, he's going to be in the documentary talking about his experience as a Trinidadian immigrant to America and what the Trinidadians say to the Haitians and the Haitians say to the Jamaicans and how there's this common conversation between those who immigrated here in the late seventies and eighties about how they had to fight their way into acceptance. He put some game on me earlier that I didn't really, under, I, I, I realized it, but I didn't realize it when he said that truth be told, Jamaicans, people from the Caribbean weren't really truly accepted from his perspective into black society, like they weren't like really down to kick it into the nineties, late eighties into the nineties. He was like in the seventies and the eighties, we were just way too different, different. We walk different. We talk different. We dress different. And niggas is mean. Niggas is going to clown. And I know he telling the truth. Cause I remember when we had, anytime we have somebody new to the school named new Gazi or some shit, we was going to clown. Not because we hate you from where you from. It's just that culturally as black folks, anything that's odd is going to get clowned. And if you too perfect, <laughs> if your life is too in order, we're going to clown that shit too. If you look too pretty, we're going to be like, look at this old light-skinned, curly-haired, green-eyed motherfucker right here looking like a fake-ass Smokey Robinson. No matter what it is, we're going to talk about you. And that's a cultural thing that we have. And it's no way these people could have eas could have contributed to what we was doing when we used to clown anybody who wasn't acting like us. And we know that's true. We know that's true. And so, because that's just how we are. We as black folk, part of our culture is having to prove ourselves from within first before we go outside. I remember what my grandmother told me years ago. I was probably like five years old, 1986. My grandfather used to call me the little fat motherfucker. Come here, little fat motherfucker. Turn the TV channel. Hey, little fat motherfucker, go in the kitchen, give me some ice cream. Hey, little fat motherfucker, go turn my coffee pot off. I swear my name was the little fat motherfucker my whole first five years of my life. And I remember crying and went to my grandmother and I was crying. I was a little boy, didn't know no better. I said, Grandmama, why do granddaddy always got to talk about me and call me the little fat motherfucker? And she was like, you know what? She said, all he's doing is, is he's making you tough. And she said, it's a tough world out there. And as black folks, the way we deal with that tough world out there is by toughing you up at home. So when you go outside, it ain't nothing the outside world can do to you that you ain't been through at home. And that's cultural when it comes to us as black Americans. We toughen each other up at home. I remember when I was a kid um, and I was in church 
I ain't look, 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 man, I'm telling you right now, youth service was some of the funnest shit in my life as a teenager. I don't care what y'all say. I hit an emoji if you was like in youth service as a kid in church. Youth service was fun than a motherfucker. Youth service as as, as uh, youth, youth, youth camp at church was the first time a little young nigga saw a titty. Nigga, we was on all kind of degenerate shit when we was kids at, at youth service. Nigga, we was, our niggas was smoking blunts at the smoking joints at, at youth camp up in the mountains. It's always, it's always one nigga brought weed and we gonna walk down the mountain thinking ain't nobody gonna know. And then we come back, blunted up, thinking that we done did some shit. And the youth minister like, where was y'all at? In the name of Jesus. You know, we we did all kind of in the name of Jesus shit. Who remember the the like, Friday night lock ins and youth service as kids and 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 the skating rink parties because it was like we gonna have we gonna have skating rink skate night to keep all the kids off the streets. I don't know how it was in y'all neighborhood in the cities y'all grew up in, but in L.A. we had this thing called gang violence. So all the churches used to have major youth programs to keep the kids from the gang violence. It would be our youth, our youth program, then West Angeles down the street, Bishop Blake, then, then Fred Price's youth service. And, you know, you couldn't wait to go because Crenshaw Christian Center had all the hoes. And, you know, so you look forward to church. Why am I saying all this? Nigga, those was the best clowning sessions was in church. Man, you couldn't even go to church in black America and not get clowned. We'd be on Wednesday night Bible study. Somebody, I remember, i never forget what time. My homegirl to this day, Lauren. I love Lauren. That's my that's my nigga. I'm so glad her and my, my wife get along because she's one of my best friends. Um. Anyway, my homegirl Lauren, fine as hell too. She, we was in youth service. I was probably like 14, and you know when you 13, 14, you grow as a young man. You grow fast. You don't. You grow fast. You see. You look y'all y'all women. Y'all don't understand. And that you you go to sleep. And you five six, and you'll wake up and be five nine. You know what I mean? But I remember when I was fourteen, I went one day I went to sleep at like five ten, and I woke up six one. Well, that happened over a weekend, and I went to church on that Sunday, and them church pants that was fit me last Sunday didn't fit me this Sunday, and I came walking in a little bit flooding. We talking about like nineteen ninety five, and the homegirl man, and it's the prettiest girl in the room. She said, Dewan. Pull your shoes up. The water's getting too high. And everybody looked at my flooding ass pants and laughed they asses off. It ain't no safe space in black America. I remember we used to be, man, shit, even in church, the jokes is flying. Why am I saying all that? People like Pete Rock like talking about toasting and these people, and me and my, my homeboy from Trinidad was talking about this earlier, how these are just cultural norms that's within what we do. And there's no group that came to America and brought us or taught us anything. And when it comes down to us clowning Caribbean people and clowning Jamaican people and these other groups like we do, even that's not personal. It's just that shit. We see an angle. Anytime a nigga see an angle, he's going to pounce when it comes to the jokes. That's just what it is. And you dealing with these groups of people who still hold on to a lot of these jokes that we gave as kids, knew that there was a separation, knew that there's a divide. They had arguments with their mommy and daddy. Mommy and daddy, stop buying me these white jeans in December. Every Jamaican kid probably had that argument with they with their Jamaican father. Uh, talking about some uh, daddy bumper clock. Hey, I cannot wear bumper clock white jeans in December. The, the American kids are going to talk about my white jeans in December. Because you know Jamaicans like wearing white jeans in December. You dig? And loafers. And then and then even worse for the Nigerian when they come over here. Goddamn. These niggas, I, I think the Nigerians don't find out Jergens till about their second generation here. That whole first generation don't even know how to spell Jergens. They're like, they don't even know the lotion aisle in Target. They only go to Target for medicine and fabuloso. And they don't they don't ever go to Target for lotion. And then, like African attire, they, they like 
they didn't dress like us. I don't know about where y'all from, but when I was a when I was a kid, even even like when Africans would come over here, these niggas would be in stonewashed jeans and a tuxedo shirt with uh with, with mandals with ashy ass pinky toes sitting outside the mandals. You know, like the mandals where the pinky toe kind of open. And all the Nigerians would be and Ghanaians would be in mandals, ashy ass stonewashed jeans, and a tuxedo shirt with no cummerbund. And that's and we it's we just different. And there's nothing wrong with that. But black black folks from America would never buy a tuxedo shirt for anything. We're not wearing tuxedo shirts. Matter of fact, a, a nigga is gonna put some J's on with that tuxedo, not some mandos. If we I know the last two times I wore a tuxedo, nigga, I had some J's on. I had some I had some elevens one time in my tuxedo. And then at another time I had wore my last time I wore a tuxedo, I had my sevens on. Yeah. We don't wear we don't we we nothing alike. And so for when someone like a Pete Rock says that it's seventy percent Jamaican. Okay, on what level? Has anyone here ever heard the word uh like he said in his tweet up there, Rasclot said in any hip hop song? Rasaclot or whatever the fuck. How you pronounce that? And I'ma get into I got Breeze up here. I know Breeze about to say some about to give a word, but I'm gonna get into uh, again to this regional shit. But I wanna talk about that shit after uh Eve say what she gotta say, then we're gonna kick it over to Breeze. Thank you. Look, you have me over here dying, like uh, zinger after zinger, um, not with the ashy pinky toe hanging out, because I just I can't get that out of my head now, because <laughs> it's so real, and they're so clueless. But look, real quick, before Breeze goes, to say that seventy, the 70s and the 80s, that's where they're trying to insert themselves, but that's completely taking away our story um pig meat markham and uh other pioneers uh james brown i think that they're trying to make hip-hop 50 so that they can say that they are at the beginning of the story and as long as we continue to speak the names of our pioneers of people who did the damn thing you know before there was a thing to be doing then they don't have any pull so I think that it's important for us to continue to do that. Uh, to the room, y'all are not going to come up here in soapbox. You will not come up here in soapbox. Just because me or Dewan might soapbox does not give you the authority to do so. I mean, I am just Eve, but this is his space. And those are the rules. Go ahead, Breeze. Peace, brother Dewan. We salute um, just Eve. Hey, family in the chat. Um, I just wanted to uh, segue off what you were saying about that. Um, as as the people in the eighty before the eighties and all that, you know, Pig Meat Markham and all them, those would be the founders and stuff like that. And what I was wanted to just say is that during like ninety six in New York, because that's where I'm from, I still couldn't even go into my Haitian friend's house or my West Indian friend's house. And most of them um, dressed like like Shaba ranks. They didn't dress like the way we dress. They were wearing like it would be cold outside and they wore like holy shirts, like the red, black and green and yellow shirts. And they had like um, Wonder Woman bangles on. And so I'm going to just um, lay my plane right there. They they didn't dress like us. <laughs> Wonder Woman. God damn he said bangles. <laughs> I said that right when I hit my blood. Nigga, I, I had some nose in my some smoke in my nose. <laughs> but but you're right. And like, and again, this is no disrespect to anybody. We're just calling it what it is. Look, a part of black American culture is clowning. And Pete Rock and all them, you want to be part of black American culture? Fine. But you gotta take it all. <laughs> you gotta that's my rule. My One last thing. They wore travel fox, and we would go in on travel fox because they look like leather sh um, socks with strings in them. Uh, yeah, see? That's, they, that's my, my rule. Okay, if people want to participate and claim pieces of black American culture, then you're going to get the parts you don't like, too. 
And that's these motherfucking jokes. We're gonna yeah, we gonna yes, we're gonna talk about how you dress. Yes, we're gonna talk about your nasty ass food. Yes, we're gonna talk about all that stuff because it's funny. And why not? We'll we do it to each other. And so since you wanna be part of the culture, then here, come come to, come get it. So that's the way I look at it. So um you don't you don't get to benefit from the culture and not deal with this side of the game because one thing we know about you motherfuckers, y'all cannot take jokes. Name the Jamaican comedian that's like hella funny. I like I like my nigga Shang. Me, 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 my, my man Shang is real cool out here. And he he out here in LA. Always looked out for me. But there ain't too many Jamaican comedians out there that's really doing like that. You know what I mean? And if they and if they are Jamaican, we don't we don't know they're Jamaican. They have a black American accent. They not uh you know, so that's just what it is. Um but you're right, they dress the way they dress. And and it's nothing wrong with dressing the way you dress, you know, dress whatever way makes you comfortable. I'm the kind of person, look, Prince got clown too. Niggas didn't just accept Prince without talking, jo cracking jokes about him. Go back and watch early Def Comedy Jam from the early 90s. Every time Dr Prince would come out with some booty shorts or, or something like that, anyone, we, we clowned the fuck out of Prince. We st every, niggas clown Michael Jackson for dressing like Captain Crunch. We love Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson can't do no wrong. But we'd always mention, oh, that nigga Michael Jackson keep flooding. And why he always wearing penny loafers? And then turn on some Twitter and be jamming our motherfucking ass on while we talking shit. That's just what we do. You know what I mean? And you're right. Every day was dressed like shopper ranks. And going on the shopper ranks thing you said, when it wasn't until the 90s, you get someone of, a, you get Jamaican culture in the forefront in some ways in hip hop. And that happens well first through Shabba Ranks and then later on through Shaggy. Uh you get you get upfront Caribbean culture. The first actual immigrant culture to get love in America was uh British. Uh Slick Rick. Slick Rick didn't change his accent. He had a British accent. He didn't he didn't try to sound like us. He he rapped like us, but Stick Rick had that accent. We knew that, like, who's this weird sounding motherfucker? But this song is dope as fuck. He was the first person to really bring the sound like where he comes from. Let's just think about this for a second. Slick Rick out of England was the first to get on the track and sound like the people from his culture and from where he comes from. Although Jamaicans were there. Nobody was sounding Jamaican. Not until Shabba Ranks. And Shabba Ranks had one big hit. Everybody that came in, and we'll acknowledge your hit, but no one that came in with a Jamaican first swag had a long-standing career. Shabba Ranks had a run. Shaggy had a run. And they made some good music, you know? But Pete Rock wasn't the first to wear his Jamaican on his sleeve. Buster Rhymes wasn't the first to wear his Jamaican on his sleeve. Well, none of these cats wearing Jamaican on their sleeve. Sig Rick definitely wore England on his sleeve. We heard it. So we're dealing with people who, when they were making their way through the ranks musically, they did not, they did not, they did not wear their Jamaican or Latino heritage on their sleeve. Um, uh, who's next, uh, Eve? Um, I think we're going to kick it to Twiz. But absolutely, they've been cosplaying as us the whole time. That's why nobody knew that a lot of these niggas is not from here. So just, uh, I think, keep that in the forefront as well. But go ahead, Twiz. What's up, DB? What's up, just Steve? Hey, DV, you had me rolling. Yeah, oh, oh boy, had me rolling when he said Shava Ranks was the first thing I thought about was in, in living color, Mister Ugly Man Java. Dude, that dude was great. I damn near fell out my chair thinking about that shit. And hey, you took me back, dude, with your conversation with your spill early. And how you said your grandfather called you, dude. My stepfather called me boy. He never called me my name my whole life. All I was boy. 
boy this, boy that. You know what I'm saying? Like you said, all I knew was boy shit. I thought I was Tarzan and shit. Boy, you know what I'm saying? And it's funny because he said the same thing. Because when we grew up, right, I didn't have no big brothers or cousins, so I always got jumped. And my stepfather used to be like, let it happen. My mother used to be like, nah, these motherfuckers ain't finna jump my son. But my stepfather always said, let it happen. Why? Because it's going to make him tough. You know what I'm saying? That's what time it is. And that's why a lot of these little these little boys out here are so soft, timid, and weak because they haven't went through the they haven't went through the gridiron. You know, they haven't went through it mentally or physically because I grew up poor. So just imagine how I got capped on. You know what I mean? I got capped on my shoes, clothes, and everything. But what it do? It make me tough. It make me mentally strong. So therefore, it ain't too many words it can get to me. You have to I have to care about you for your words to get to me. If not, Fuck you. It's just like a motherfucking bum begging for five dollars. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, man. It's funny on how we keep having this conversation about the gentlemen from Jaland trying to insert themselves in our business, knowing goddamn well nobody was rapping. You know, they damn sure don't have a style. They damn sure don't dress with finesse with a style that's blessed. Because they over there, like you say, walking around with their motherfucking pinky toe hanging out like a motherfucking baby to be- a baby potato. You know what I'm saying? It's bad out here that I hate to say this and all respect to my brothers from the East, but we're having this issue with people from the East Coast. You know? And they're going at it with New York for the simple fact New York is the so-called Mecca, but motherfuckers was rapping way before then. You know? Like DB, you know, my dad numbers in music. They was rapping way before then. Rapping was part of the thing, but rapping was really grassroots. That was our little hit and quote shit that we just kept to ourselves. But motherfuckers got so good with it to where they start putting rhythm and rhymes behind it. Next thing you know, boom, look at what it birthed into. You know what I'm saying? Then the style came in with the dress, you know, because when I was growing up, you know, I always I'm, said. I'm on that point you said about rapping. I'm, I'm going to let you finish. So I, I'm hearing this point while I still was fresh in my mind. Yeah. About but I just want, I'm, I'm going to end it quick. I'm just going to say like this. When I was growing up, at first, rappers was like the rappers on the East Coast used to dress like fucking, like dress, like fucking Prince in the vip, like Prince and how they used to dress in the eighties and shit. But then I started noticing Probably. rappers started dressing like niggas from the streets. How niggas from dressing like B boys? Like I said, I remember the fit in the eighties. Adidas was the shit. You know what I'm saying? And if a nigga had a certain fit on, oh yeah, this nigga grinding or he rolling. But hey, I'm gonna land it there. Go ahead, pick up your point. What you were saying about like uh, lost the point. Uh, God damn it! Um, Don't you hate that shit, man? I hate that shit. You had said something, Eve. Do you remember where, where did I stop him at, Eve? I forgot. Uh, it was right after he was talking about being called boy. Right before he was talking about pinky toe with a potato. I'm sorry, okay, Twitch, nah, it, was something else. it was something else. It was something else. Yeah, but, the, but I, no, I, it was just I, about I, rapping. We was talking about rapping. Oh, rapping. That's what it was. We were talking about rapping. Yeah. We talking about rapping. I thought about Curtis Mayfield. I'm your mama. I'm your daddy. I'm that nigga in the alley. I remember my first time. I remember when we was in elementary school. It was this one kid. You know, in school, you get the kids that y'all try. You come to school thinking you're the first person that heard something. And so one of the kids, like first grade, like you ever hear that song? I'm your mama. I'm your daddy. My daddy was playing that, and they was rapping way back then. I remember having this conversation in the first grade with one of my friends. And then coming home to my father, I'm like, what song is that? He's like, oh, that's Curtis Mayfield. What you know about that? He played it for me. He pulled the album out and played it for me. And I remember, I was like, Daddy, you mean they was rapping back then? He was, my dad was like, yeah. yeah. I was like, yeah, shit ain't nothing new. And then, and then, he, then, he, then he puffed his blunt, this joint, drank his beer, and went back to watching the Lakers. That's how that conversation went. With Magic Johnson turns the ball over. James James Worthy misses the catch. That's what happened after I asked my dad that question. Magic turned the ball over. I'll never forget that shit. <laughs> so, um, that's just some cultural stuff. Like that's here's what our rap shit. Is. That's rap. our shit. Rap is spit and game. You Hold know on. what I mean? Go rap ahead. was always the breakdown within the song. Rap was always there. It just wouldn't carry the whole song, other than songs like a song, a song here or there. There may be a rap interlude or a rap, a rap song on a record, but usually when it came time to rap, the rap was a breakdown at the end of the song or the middle of somewhere within the song, and then we get back to uh to the to the to the rest of the music. Here's the reason why rap ended up becoming 
um, as big as it got. When you take music out the schools, now you don't. You have people who are artists; they're they're they're, they're musicians, but they have no outlet to. They have no way to learn. They don't. If they don't go to church and join the choir, they'll never learn how to hit that C flat. They'll never learn how to harmonize and blend without instruction. But you can rap without having to understand keys and all that stuff. And if you get signed, you can learn that stuff later on if you get signed. Because not as, even though they do, you do rap in key and rap, that's stuff that you can learn and pick up. The hardest part is really learning how to rap. You can do that with you can rap with no musical training. You can just take a beat and listen to something on the radio, and niggas did that shit all the time. Somebody playing on the radio, or any of it, it could be a Alice Nigger ciphering over it. So rap, you don't need all of those other pieces to make a song. I'm gonna get to you, Kid Gravity. Um, you don't need you don't need. It's a much more easier style of music to make it doesn't require much um you don't have to put a band together you don't have to arrange music to match the song you don't have to put in these uh bridges and all that stuff it's all good eve if you got eve if you got a bounce it's all good um but in rap you don't have to do all this extra shit you could just go so rap so when when rap hip-hop took over as they took music out of the schools and and stopped playing music on the radio, stopped hiring musicians because by the time you get to the mid 80s it basically got rid of the bands by the mid 80s, everything becomes electronic as you get into the late 80s and into the 90s, so not only do you have not teaching music, when you turn your radio on, you're not hearing musicians play you're hearing a program you're hearing an NPC and if you learn an NPC, you're now the whole band and so now it's less music out there. So now rap becomes more dominant because you don't have to be as classically trained to do it and to be good at it. That's why rap took over. Not because if not because it was just this old, great, huge, storm busting form of music. No, it took over because it's easier and cheaper. Flat out. And as you get into the two thousands. 90s they per for every dollar they they put in the hip hop they took out of R and B budgets they didn't take budgets from rock and roll they didn't take budgets from the country division they didn't take budgets from the pop division they took budgets from the R and B divisions and put them in hip hop as you get into the 90s that's a fact so as they cheapened the sound of R and B by pulling the budgets of R&B and putting it in a rap. Now, money that should have gone to Eric Roberson, because he should have been a great, money that should have gone to Terrell Hicks. I told y'all yesterday, I was in Philly this past uh, weekend with, uh, with uh, Terrell Hicks singing. And when I heard her sing, I knew she could sing. You know, I, I remember her from Belly. I knew she was a dope-ass artist. But I didn't know she could sing like that. And I was sitting there thinking, yo, yo, nigga, I was cheated. This woman with a voice like this, she should have had a decade of hits. But in order for her voice to get hits, that would require a music industry that's going to fund a full band, live band, uh, horn section, background singers, and string arrangements. Those are the ingredients to make a proper rhythm and blues song. Live band, background singers, horns and strings. You can get away with uh, not having horns. Uh, the Isley Brothers got away with no horns. Isley Brothers is probably one of the only bands that ever got away with not having horns. Um, but outside of the Isley Brothers, that's what you need. But they still have the live band and the arrangements. That's what you need that's what Adele gets. The reason why Adele Adele gets so much money because they give Adele all the ingredients needed to make a proper rhythm and blues song. And she gets proper promotion. Well, imagine a voice like Shantae Moore getting that. What could she do it? But Shantae Moore's career got sacrificed for hip-hop. 
Frank McCombs' career got sacrificed for hip hop. Jennifer Hudson's career. You can go down the line. Ruben Stuttered. You can go down the line of all these rhythm and blues artists that should have had long standing careers, but because the industry decided to defund rhythm and blues to put the money in the hip hop, they didn't. All that stuff plays a part in the game. Um, but Eve, I know you got to go pretty soon, so you can say your last words real quick before I kick it to Kid Gravity. Definitely like the fact that we are saying that if you want a piece of our culture, you will take all of it because you can't just have, we don't half-ass anything over here. Um, so to Pete Rock and to everybody else who wants to claim that they are the originators, the founders of anything that's ours, you know, um, I say welcome. Welcome to the jokes. Welcome to the dozens. And, you know, you can't be that grown man who was called an African booty scratcher in the third grade and then, you know, be out here at 38 years old and still having an issue. Um, I think... I think that, well, I think I like that the people from the Caribbean have amalgamated to our sound um, because now in 2023, you've got people who are acting like they don't want to be us. You know, they don't want to be labeled black. They want to be Jamaican. They want to claim and rep their flags. But back when it all started, they wanted to be away from all of that. They very much wanted to not be them other niggas. They wanted to be us. And now that we're saying who we are, well, it forces them to stand on their square. So stand on your square. Or get rid of your square. But see, we can't even have a whole Black first conversation because they don't even know what it is to be Black. They just know what it is to look like us and wear our, co our costume and talk about things that they've been next to, but not in so shout out to you for having your documentary shout out to Tariq for his documentary i think that um everybody who's going to be speaking truth to power about our story you know uh needs to have some special accolades so thank you for that and um i guess we're going to kick it to kid gravity appreciate it go ahead uh, brother kid gravity Good evening to the room. Hey, Duan B, why you messing with our with, with our chick lord, aka the fishnet shirt? Why you messing with it? <laughs> Come on, bro. I mean, it's look. I saw a Jamaican the other day that was dressed like the Asian on the Last Dragon. You remember the fishnet shirt? Suki yaki. Now, what color was the fishnet? Cause we gotta know if he's a real Jamaican. It was black. That's not a real Jamaican. This has got to be red, red, yellow, and, and red, gold, and green. Uh, I, I saw one of those too in Lamert we, we, Park. We'll even let the black trim pass. Okay, okay. Now I, was, I saw him in Lamert Park. I was like, all right, but <laughs> what it was, I had ran out of weed, and I, I knew I knew the Jamaicans had some. So hey, uh, salute you to him. You, you should have asked him how how long it takes him to make his oxtails. <laughs> I was just offended because I had to see his nipples to get that reed weed. Oh but, Jesus! Yeah. <laughs> did he, did he ahead, have bro. on the Did he have on the the Negril sandals? <laughs> Uh, I, I look at his feet. I was scared too. All right. I have a question now. I saw this tweet that you put in the in the you know in the observatory called "If Hip Hop Didn't Come from Jamaica, Then Tell Me Why So Many Jamaicans in Hip Hop." Um, here's the thing. Now, while y'all were talking, I was half listening. I I just did some quick scrolling just to see if there's any hip hop events in Jamaica because you know that's where hip hop came from, according to. My my people. This is where it came from, right? How come there ain't no hip hop events down there? You mean tell me it ain't no hip hop fifty events in Kingston and shit on the beach? No, bro. I went on Eventbrite. I went on Ticketmaster. And I went on Bands in Town. No hip hop events. But they have an Afro Beats and a Soka and a Dance Hall event on the day before Christmas. Oh yes. And I'm sure when he played a hip hop record by mistake, that everybody gonna boo and they gonna throw their their red stripe bottles at the at the selector. So like when when hip hop come on to those events, like when I just say just say we had a soca party or a, one of those other bumble clock parties, if if, if they play uh, Ludacris, what's gonna happen? 
I'm I I so somebody you're gonna hear a that's somebody's machete coming out. You better pack up and go. God damn! All right. Yeah. I mean, we saw what happened up in in Toronto with with Carnival. They started playing trap music and they they lost their mind. So not only so they can't like, they they can't even take it in stride. Like we'll we'll listen to some of that uh, Jamaican music for about good twenty minutes, fifteen minutes before we tell a. The DJ turn. They won't even give it like 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, I don't even think y'all would get one track in. Hey. I don't think I don't think Jamaica is too receptive to Ice Spice. Oh, and didn't they have a rule with in Jamaica where they like about a year ago where they said they're gonna like ban rap? Mm-hmm. Like- no, the the well that. Yes, it was something like that, but it was mostly about like the the hardcore, vulgar dance hall lyrics, like they did that years ago. Okay, but yeah, I I I listen to Jamaican stations out there. They don't play no type of rap. The only time you'll hear a rapper on there is if they they mix their song in during the set. But yeah, just to play a full like hip hop song, nah, you ain't gonna hear that. Like I think I think the DJ will curse you out if you call in and ask for a hip hop record. Like that, man. That's shit. Man, I appreciate that information, brother. Yes, sir. Uh stay keep your foot on their neck, because this is annoying because Jamaica Jamaicans don't have access to the good beaches down there, but they worried about hip hop. Pete Rock should have used his platform for that, but of course he didn't. Real talk, man. I appreciate that, brother. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nah, he's right though. Like, that's some real shit. Jamaica does not have Jamaicans don't have access to something like what seventy seven percent of their beaches, something like that. They don't have access to. Yeah, the good ones, the good ones. And, yeah, and, and so Jamaicans Jamaicans don't have access to their own beaches, but they want access to ownership of hip hop. And you got if P Rock says seventy percent of the founders of Jamaicans. Hip hop, where the fuck is the the Jamaican hip hop version of We Are the World? Then, nigga, where is the Jamaican hip hop version of motherfucking We All in the Same Game? Like, well, can y'all re- can y'all can can we get a a bumper clock version of uh uh can we can we use our can we use our beaches? We should have said, ooh yeah, ooh yeah, scared by the little nut and dead end. Can we use our beaches in Delhi? Come on, can we do some of like that? Like, can we can can we can we, can we say one beach, one beach? Let's get together and get one beach. Can we, where that song at? You know, uh, can we can we can we can we, can we, can, we, can we get that? Like like this is your home. Like you mean to tell me? Asians and Pacific Islanders can enjoy the beach. White folks that 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 smell like pig nuts can enjoy the beach. My black ass can come over as a foundational black American and go to the beach. You can't go to. You know, you know how that makes me feel as a black American when I found that out. That makes me not want to go to Jamaican beaches. Like I didn't know that until recently that they can't use even though we got these weird ass Jamaicans trying to take our history there's still something inside of me that will feel a little bit funny going to a beach knowing that the lake the locals can't go that's like that's not right but I'm gonna tell you right now if Buster Ryan keep talking that's gonna be my next vacation I'm gonna go to the beach and play Nate Dog and Crip Walk on the Sand, and be like, and I'm 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 I'm, I'm gonna spell out Bumba Clot and cross it out with the Sea Walk, nigga. Since y'all wanna claim, and I'm gonna do that shit, nigga, while listening to to Nate to the East Siders, nigga. I'm gonna be listening to some DJ Quick and, and Skilo, nigga. I'll be listening to some some of that. And, nigga, and crib walking, and, nigga. I'm be, I'm, I'm, I'm a spell out, nigga. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a spell out blood clot, nigga. And I'm a spell out Kingston, and I'm, then I'm a, then I'm a blood walking out, nigga. Just, and I don't even bang. 
if you keep if you motherfuckers keep talking shit about owning our music. Go spell out FBA, that'll really piss them off. I'm a I'ma go down to them beaches and I'ma run all kind of reckless because y'all can't even do nothing about it. Because you're not allowed there. <laughs> Think about that shit. Niggas can go to the beach in Jamaica right now and do all kind of uh, reckless shit. And the local Jamaicans wouldn't even be allowed to come and stop it because they can't come to the beach. <laughs> I, that's wrong if you ask me. But it's funny. It's still funny when you deal with these people coming around trying to claim our heritage and they can't claim a beach. Ain't that a bitch? <laughs> Ain't that a bitch? What's up, Mikhail? Anybody ever never want to come on here? Uh, raise your hand if you want to speak. Man, I'll tell you right now, I was in Philly this past weekend. Hey, Brother Mikhail, you got a beautiful city, my man. I felt the energy of it. I didn't get to go all throughout the city. I, for the most part, stayed up there. My hotel was over there near uh, Ben Franklin's grave. I wanted to go and piss on that motherfucker. But that was, that was my first time in Philly. And one thing I do when I go to a new city, I like to walk around that city, especially at night, and just get the energy of it. And usually I get on a shroom. Usually I take some shrooms and walk around so I can really feel it, feel the energy of the city through my pores. Um, that's usually, but I didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't take my shroom bar on me because I'm going to be shrooming here in Palm Springs tomorrow night. That's why. But I didn't get the, but I still got to go. And I just walked through Philly for like five hours. I just walked. And I played a lot of gambling huff. I played a lot. I play local music when I go places. A lot of, of course, Jill Scott and, and Soul Query and style, style music. And I really got to feel the energy of, you know, why the city is so is so important musically. And when I was out there, I I was in the re I was in the libraries doing research for the documentary. And um I came across some of the earliest uh sheet music ever written by black Americans. I came across in that museum a display of some free black people doing music and touring the world in the 1830s, y'all. And this is and this is when slavery was still going on in the north. You had black people touring black Americans, free black Americans, during the time of slavery in all 13 colonies, still writing sheet music and touring the world. See, they like to always make it seem as if all of our music comes from slavery. Hell no. Nah. Now, a lot of our music comes from slavery because most of us were enslaved. But it's a whole lot of music that came from lines and lineages of black people who were never enslaved. And they were writing sheet music. Just go see when you watch a movie, the, the last slave movie I watched was 12 Years a Slave. I don't really watch those kind of movies. But the last one I watched all the way through was 12 Years a Slave. And in 12 Years a Slave, pay attention. You you gotta pay attention to what they're saying without saying. These movies say a lot of things without saying a lot of things. Again, these movies say a lot of things without saying a lot of things. In 12 Years a Slave, what was the thing? This man knew how to play the violin. He was a classically trained free man that got captured in slavery and sold off. What are they telling you? They're telling you that black people were doing music as free men during the times of slavery. And a lot of them were captured as free men and so on. But they're telling you right there, right in front of your face, that whether on the plantation or free, you niggas are doing music. But they're not going to, these white supremacists aren't going to tell you overtly. One thing about how they operate, I'm going to get to you, Miriam. The way the white supremacists operate is the way they deal with their karma and how they see karma differently the way we the way we see it. Their karma, if they tell you what you're doing, what they're doing, that absolves them the karma. According to them, it's your it's your free will and your choice. And technically they're right. 
Now, how they go about showing it to you is very extremely deceptive. They're not going to tell you, hey, black people, look, pay attention. This one, no, they're not going to do that. But they'll keep putting it in your face, what they're doing and what the true history is and what's really going on. Hell, they, they showed you in the movie Life. Even though it's an Eddie Murphy movie, the white supremacists are still the ones that allowed it to, to get to be released. That, yeah, a lot of you niggas got put up in jail for nothing. Right. you damn right. But the common denominator, whether free or enslaved, was we was doing music. We got to understand that. For real, for real, for real. It's much bigger than hip-hop. It's much bigger than hip-hop. That's why, like, y'all, if y'all go to my website, right, it's right there in the, in the Jumbotron. Uh, please, 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 I want to see y'all, I want to see everybody in here be a part of my live stream pay-per-view event. You know, you can donate to the GoFundMe, but also I really, 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 really would like you guys to be in attendance when I live stream my documentary premiere because I want y'all to be able to ask me questions right off top. And, you know, and then, and then help me expound. I, I'll... I'll be able to expound upon some things. It's so much information jam packed in that 40 minutes. I'm going to 30 minutes. I'm going to show you guys. It's so much information. So you guys got to be a part of that. But uh, Miriam, it's on you. Hey, good evening, Dawn B. How you doing, brother? It's good to hear from you, Miriam. What's on your mind? Indeed. Um, shout out to some of my peeps in the room. Um, I just wanted to expound upon a few things, um, mainly to bed you back over to what you just spoke about. Um, the fact that um, white supremacy tend to do things in your face and they do it, you know, as a sick, um, sadistic joke. Um, they do a lot of fiction, but mix and rap, um, rap with the truth. So therefore you have to take the science out of the fiction and you're a brother that read the cards and so you know about divine law and you know about um you know the principles of the universe and so having said that they are under divine law so they have to reveal um truth but they do it with trickery and so um just that on that part and then um that's what it was saying um at Pete Rock says 70% of the founders of hip hop are Jamaican. <laughs> Is this true or not? Of course not. How ridiculous. Um, they only got a taste of what, um, how to do harmonies and rhythms and tones, not saying that they never were able to sing because most melanated people could, can and have their own language and forms of music, but none on the planet are like FBA. Nowhere in the world does it exist. Only on this Northern American continent by the, in, I won't even say indigenous, the indigenous native um, foundational black American children of chattel slavery, freedmen, period. And as you were discussing that, um, you know, um, there were freed men and women doing music and mainly men. Um, this is very true because I had one of the world renowned um, master um, teachers. Um, he was a, um, author, um, he did the orchestras and stuff like that. And he traveled abroad to uh, France and throughout Europe and um, home. And his name was Dr. Eugene Haynes. And he, often mentioned he said we were doing music and doing things um even during the period of slavery and um he was um saying how we could move freely in the arts until of course they got jealous you know and they always um would in try imprison a man that was free of course and enslave him and then and you know in terms enslave his lineage so that was the double-edged sword that you you dealt with, just like the banking system. We are the ones behind the banking system. Um, you know, our industrial and 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 uh, lineage, if you will, 
um, is behind a lot of things because a lot of uh, what we created was as you know, taken from us and um, put out by others or um, they got the patent for it and going back this my point I'm getting ready to name um, to Jamaica um, when I say they were doing the sky and they only got that because they were influenced deeply by foundational black American um, singers who were doing R&B and, um, and, and blues but mainly R&B Bob Marley um, um, Peter Tosh and um, Bunny Weller those are the three um, icons in Jamaica re reggae or they got known um, and some of the old they are one of the oldest um, groups and they were the ones doing Sky along with some a few other groups but they were known because they were pushed to the forefront mainly because Bob Marley was Bob's um, child and um, the true rebel behind their music was actually Peter Tosh and having said that, when you go into dance hall, because they did Sky and then they later did um, Roots Rock Reggae and then Lovers Rock. So they have these different branches. And um, then you get into um, what they're trying to steal and say that they did rap it is with dance hall music. And uh, you know, like that. It did a form of some form of rap. But it was not like ours. Your phone is going out. I mean, I'm not sure if you hear, but your, your phone is going out. It's in and out. But I I hear what you were saying as far as evolution. Can you, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. I you, can hear you. You, you probably have to go out and come back in. But um, but I'm uh, pick up what you I'll, I'll let you get back up here. But I'm pick up on what you're saying. Sure. You might, mm -hmm. I you go out. Might need to go out and come back in. Um, well, you know, one thing she was pointing out and talking about was like the different forms of music that they've had. This is a, a part of the conversation I was having earlier with one of my boys from Trinidad. Every evolution in Caribbean music over the last 70 years came after an evolution in our music. So, Ska, Rocksteady, that was their attempt at early R&B, early rock and roll. Chuck Berry style rock and roll. Um, when you come to Sky Rock Steady, when you get to reggae, that was their attempt at Motown. That's what that was. Motown changed the world. I think not enough can be said for how much Motown changed the world. The Temptations alone, the, the epitome of 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 sharp, clean, sophisticated is the Temptations. For men, the epitome of beauty, class, and elegance is Diana Ross and the Supremes for women. They're still the standards. New Edition, from everybody from New Edition to the Dramatics to Jodeci was trying to be the Temptations. Every group from Destiny's Child to TLC to The Emotions were trying to be Diana Ross and the Supremes. These are the people who, one thing that one point that I bring up in my documentary is on every level from singing to instrumentation to performance, the standard is a black America. Either we invented the instrument from scratch or someone else invented it and put it in the hands of a black American to show the world how to play it. We did not invent the 808, but we showed the world how to play it. When the bass guitar was first invented, it was put into a black man's hands to show the world the electric bass how to play it. When same thing with the electric guitar and every other instrument, the Rhodes keyboard, you better think Herbie Hancock only comes a lot of these electric sounds on the keyboard. That man is still living. How often did, did hip hop? Question, did hip-hop ever once honor Herbie Hancock? That man is still living. He couldn't get his flowers and he's still living? Think about this for a second. Herbie put his 
music career on the line, his credibility on the, on the line to, to do the song Rocket. R rap was a fringe sound that everyone was was expecting to go away and die. Herbie, when Herbie Hancock did Rocket, what that did was it told everybody else that had an issue with rapping hip hop to stand down. Because ain't none of you niggas colder than Herbie Hancock. That's what that move. That was a power move. That was a power play. How many people honored that power play that Herbie Hancock made for hip hop? Because we're talking about the epitome of jazz greatness when you're talking about Herbie Hancock. And even even that was 40 years ago. But 40 years ago, Herbie Hancock was already uh, damn near 20 years into greatness. He was two get decades in. That was his, he was entering his, and when he gets to the 80s, he's entering in his third decade of greatness. Starting out with Donald Byrd, being discovered by Donald Byrd. And if you don't know who Donald Byrd is, catch up. Being discovered by Donald Byrd. And then being put on the world stage by Miles Davis. Herbie Hancock, when he did, and I'm going to get to you next, uh, Cool Breeze. Um, you next, Cool Breeze. Um, and then I'm going to get to the Stingy after that. But I'm going to say this point about Herbie Hancock. The album Bitches Brew by Miles Davis. That was the first time a Rhodes was used in jazz. And he brought that that sound and expanded that sound. The first time a Rhodes was used. And that was on Bitches Brew. Herbie brought in the all the um the talk box. Even though he didn't have invent the talk box, before you get to Zapp and Roger, go back and listen to a song by Herbie Hancock um, called Come, uh, Come Running to Me. Go back and listen to that the whole Sunlight album, Herbie Hancock Sunlight. On that album in 1977, he's using a talk box. The talk box is, is essential to hip-hop, a sound that will made it kind of get cheapened in the way Akon used it. But, well, he didn't quite use the talk box. He used the auto-tune, which was a derivative of that. Even auto-tune. Auto-tune was created for Cher. Cher couldn't sing. They wanted Cher to sound like black women. And she couldn't hit them notes. So they created auto-tune for people who, like Cher, who they wanted to sound black, but they couldn't. Black people turned auto-tune into an instrument. It was never meant to be an instrument. It was made, It was created to correct the note here and there. It was never meant to be an instrument. We turned it into an instrument. That's how motherfucking dope we are on all levels. And the point of this documentary is I'm tired of fucking... I said it 15 years ago when I was working with children, uh, Hathaway Sycamores. I'm not going to let another generation of black kids grow up without knowing who the fuck they are. And we could talk about hip hop all day, but hip hop at the end of the day is a small segment, a very small segment of all of our creations. I don't think we understand how small hip hop is relative to the music we've been creating over the last 350 some odd years on record. We really don't understand how small hip hop is in this conversation. So it's time to take these niggas in the deep water. That's, that's, that's my purpose. That's my goal. And that's why the fund of my documentary is so important. I'm not, I'm not about to play tiddlywinks with these niggas and go back and forth over who was the first DJ. No, 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 no. We about to go in the deep water and tell you where your forefathers learned it from. We're going to show the black Americans that the Jamaican, the Puerto Rican, the Brazilian, the white, Everybody around the world, we're going to show you the black person that taught them. And then we're going to show you the line of black people who was influ who influenced that black person that the white folks liked and Jamaicans liked. We're going into deep water. Let's see if these niggas can swim. It's on you, Cool Breeze. Hey, I appreciate it, brother uh, Dewan B, man. How you doing, man? And uh, definitely um, supported your, your documentary, man. I, I love how you... Uh, 
breaking everything down and the congratulations on getting everything started because man uh i appreciate your work definitely going to be there when you know uh when you drop that documentary out um another thing man i wanted to make a point that you know see you know having all you know jamaicans and hispanics talking about they created hip-hop or whatever 50 50 and all this kind of stuff and here's here's a question you know i always throw at them is where where's all the 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 major record labels in jamaica right how come they didn't start there because you know whether hispanics or anyone else they should be producing all the rappers should be coming out of jamaica instead of Jamaicans and Puerto Ricans and all that kind of stuff, they're coming here, um, attaching themselves, tethering themselves to our culture and then becoming, becoming a, a rap artist. We're not going to Jamaica or Puerto Rico or any other Hispanic country to become a rapper. We're right here in America. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, we, we created rap and hip hop. They got it from our culture. You know, man, uh, so I'm definitely glad that you are doing uh, Brother Tariq are doing uh, this documentary because it's so um, it's so needed, man. And I, I'm going to yell the mic, fam. Much appreciated, Cool Breeze. Much appreciated. Um, yeah, that's the thing. I'm glad you said that way because there's space for my, my documentary and Tariq's. I, I, I look at it. We're not stepping on each other's feet. Um my mind, mind has been my premiere. Mine has been a, a long way in the works. If you look at a tweet that I put up earlier today, I showed you a clip from a, well, a screenshot of me on October twentieth last year. What you guys about to see in this documentary premiere was filmed August two thousand twenty two, and so it was filmed a year and three months ago. And about 45 pounds ago for me, I'm still a big ass nigga, but I look at that picture. I'm like, God damn, I'm like the marshmallow man of that motherfucker. I done lost a cool like 40, 45 pounds since this, uh, since I filmed the documentary. It's just that I was editing and I took things in, took things out. It just wasn't right. It didn't finally get right until like about a month ago. It was finally right about a month ago. Like I, had, I changed the music bed out two or three times. Uh, took things out, changed footage. I've been, it's, I've been. This is my first time. This is my first time. So, so I appreciate you guys' patience. But I'm the kind of person that like, what's up, Scotty Jenkins in the room? People who who follow me on my YouTube channel know that. I like myself to be right, man. I don't like bullshit. If you've ever gotten a card reading from me, anything you've ever done with me professionally, man, that shit got to be right. I don't fuck around. I do not fuck around. I don't. I appreciate black people's money. My whole life, I've been supported by black people. Going back to when I was, I paid my way through college um, as a loan officer at a, uh, in Inglewood, California, downtown Inglewood, all black customers. When I was doing my mortgage banking, yeah, I made way for some white folks. But I had always it was always worth the black side of town. Black people helped me pay my way through college cash because I've always worked with black folks. And so I love us and I give us the, my best. I really do. And so, but part of that is a nigga trying to be a perfectionist and sitting on this goddamn footage for, for a goddamn year. <laughs> I probably should have put it out last December, but I just, I ain't never done this before. So I'm I'm just trying I'm making it right, you know. Just I just I want the shit to be right. I want it to be right, you know. I I hold black people like I I treat my black customer the way most niggas treat white people. You dig? I don't give I give but I give it to us. And so um that's why I really, really want you guys to be a part of the live stream pay per view event so you guys can watch it right along with me and then ask me questions afterwards. I have limited seating in that, and it's, it's only $35, but that $35 is going to fund the full project. And let me tell you real quick, and I'm going to get to you, Stingy, next. The, the, the full project ain't going to just be me. I'm introducing you to me in this documentary. <laughs> the real one? The one I have coming? 
I can't tell you the names that I have so far, but I got certain rappers that have been in the game 40 years that it's going to be a part of it. I got singers who have won Grammys that are going to be a part of it. I got composers that you've never heard of. You've never heard their names, but you've definitely heard their music. That's going to be talking about the science behind the music. Why does that E flat minor make you feel that way? That's the kind of shit I'm breaking down in the full length documentary. We're going to get all the way into the science, nigga. We're going to be talking about, okay, this F major seven transition to a G minor nine and what that does to your spirit and why black people use it and where it comes from and who brought it in and who still uses it today and why these chord changes where they came from and, and how these core changes exist in hip hop and how it's all science that we, nigga, I'm going deep on this shit. <laughs> if y'all think I'll be telling y'all a lot on these Twitter spaces, I promise you I only tell you 10% of what I know. I'll give you niggas the same 10% of what I understand on these Twitter spaces. It goes, it's not enough time and space to talk about this shit on Twitter spaces. And some of the stuff I, I know, but I can't explain too well. And one thing about me, I tend to stick in my wheelhouse to what I can explain. I don't like to talk out of thing out of the boundaries of what I can explain personally. So in the full length documentary, things that I, I I can ask the right questions for people I know that understand these things conceptually to answer. And that's what you're going to get in the full length documentary. And that's what you purchasing a pass for the documentary short premiere. That's what you're purchasing for. You have one getting a copy of my documentary, you're getting the Q&A, but you're also funding the larger goal. And so that's why it's so important, right? But uh, next we got Stingy. Nigga, you doing all that Benji. lying. You're going to have vanilla ice in that shit. Stingy bro. Benji, what's up? You go. Know, stop making up shit, the wine. <laughs> Nigga, who gonna be in it? Nigga? Are you there, Stingy Benji? Why you don't want to tell us who gonna be in it though? For real. Can y'all can y'all hear him speak? I can't I can't hear him. Yeah, I can hear you. Is it me? Shit. Nigga, you can't hear me? Can y'all hear Stingy Benji? Let me know. I can't hear him. Oh shit. Hey, well, Stingy Benji, I can't hear you and I want to hear what you gotta say. So what I'm gonna do is gonna... I'm gonna kick you off as a speaker and then come back. All right, nigga. Uh, I could I couldn't hear him. I want to hear what he got to say. Um, but come back, and maybe I can hear you. Uh, but uh, and while Stingy Benji working out, right, can you hear me now? I, I hear you now. Go ahead, brother. You lying, now. nigga? You just gonna have Vanilla Ice or somebody in that shit sitting here playing with us like this, nigga? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing all of this baby. bullshit for Vanilla Ice. Nigga. <laughs> hey, but look, you mentioned Herbie Hancock, bro, right? And the reason Herbie don't get no props is there's a lot of jealousy around Herbie because a lot of motherfuckers feel like he got to shine. But, you know, they try to give the credit to Grand Wizard Theodore for inventing the scratch. Now, in New York, they argue in circles among themselves about whether or not he was even Theodore or Flash. Because they cousins. So it's not really, nobody has really come to a conclusion about who actually invented the scratch. But they don't like to give the props to uh, Herbie Hancock because a lot of people looked at him like, you know, he, he gained everything, I guess, after they so-called invented it or whatever. So Hey, hey, I'm going to let you finish your point. But I, I got to go jump in and finish your point. Um. That right there is is part of the, is a major part of the problem when it comes to hip hop. Cats are so busy fighting and jockeying for position instead of understanding that music is a collaborative effort. Who the fuck cares who invented? Because Herbie Hancock, I, I I go see him every year at the Hollywood. Bowl. I see I've seen Herbie Hancock twenty five times at least. Sometimes I see him twice a year when he comes when he's in L A. And I've never heard him say he invented the scratch. Well. And I'm glad you brought that point up because I have heard that. I forgot all about that argument. I have heard people arguing, saying that Herbie Hank kind of mad at him in his position, saying that he commercialized, rapped, he did this. 
man, that and that's to me that's just so sad and unfair because what he did was the ultimate thing he did was all of the other musicians because you got to realize 1983 when Rocket comes out, we're coming off the heels of the greatest musical decade in in known history, the 1970s. Musically, the 1970s was the greatest era, greatest decade of music. Whether you're talking about in rock and roll, funk, disco, jazz, even though jazz kind of hit its zenith with Coltrane in 68, 69, the, the turn that jazz made in the 70s was an awesome turn with the fusion jazz thing going on. It's just musically... The 70s was just so musically abundant, and there were so many musicians who, by 1982, 83, no longer have a job because the sound is going electronic. And those who couldn't keep up with the electronic sound, those who just knew how to play their trumpet or play their bass, they were now obsolete because of these sounds. So Herbie gets it on both ends. The people, the musician side of the game, who was like, you legitimize this crap, now we don't have a job. And then on the hip-hop side of the game, Herbie gets criticized, you just tried to do what we did, and you made a cheesy version of it. When at the end of the day, both sides, although they may have a point, both sides are missing the point. What Herbie did was he saw that there was a new sound coming. And him doing Rocket, it told everyone from his generation, all those musicians from the 70s who looked up to Herbie, it told them all, stand down. These new cats, these young cats, they got a new thing coming, and we might as well embrace it because we can't stop it. So once Herbie did that, once Herbie does that, I don't care how good you are on a guitar, you ain't did what Herbie did musically, so what can you say? And then James Brown said, I don't mind them doing what they do. I just wanted them to give me credit. So you follow that up with James Brown said, I don't mind the rappers. Just give me credit. Those things is what took the guard dogs off and allowed hip hop to now grow. And anyone who said anything after that, their voices are now mute because you're, their voices were not bigger voices musically than Herbie Hancock or even Richard and Toomey. It was Juicy Fruit when he went when he, when he embraced that sound. It was when those guys embraced the sound that it took the guard dogs off and it made the older generation back the fuck up. And that's where we as a as a as a culture as black people need to be more appreciative as a culture. And because our brother Stingy brought up a great point, because he I, I'm I'm glad he brought up that point because that fight did exist. I forgot I forgot all about that fight. I appreciate you bringing that up. And it's such a silly, silly, silly fight. We get into some silly fights. And these silly fights we get into culturally has opened the door for people who aren't from our culture to claim jump our culture. Go, but go ahead and finish what you got to say, my brother. No, nah, that was it, man. I just wanted to, you know, because I think a lot of younger people, they might not even have even heard Rocket or even understand what it, what it was. But it, it comes about about eight years. Like I say, after they say uh, Theodore kind of, I guess, uh, perfected the technique of scratching. But, uh, you know, that whole that whole who invented scratching is a whole different ball game. So, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's something that I think should be delved into, because, like I say, I don't know whether Theodore did it or uh, or Flash, but I've actually seen Theodore fall out on a live stream on YouTube. I want to say with Raheem or somebody uh, over over this whole issue of who actually invented the scratch. So uh, yeah, and, and I now, to that to that point, I agree with you. It does need to be worked out between those two. But when people throw Herbie Hancock in the mix, that's what it's like. Chill. He never said he invented it. He just put it on the record. You know, yeah, they, they don't even like to acknowledge Herbie. That's like you know, that's the part that's criminal. If you ask me, now, that's kind of the way Cash treat uh. The uh, Sugar Hill Gang. It's like, eh, that was really right. my shit, you know? Right, right. So, I appreciate that. All right, man. But going on to what uh, even more, 
Rest in peace, Roy Hargrove. His birthday was uh yesterday, actually. Um, died in 2018. I put up a post yesterday about Roy Hargrove and saying that through all of this hip hop 50 celebration, and I'm gonna get to you, Miriam. And anyone else who wants to speak, just go ahead and uh hit the invite button, I'll let you speak. Through all this Hip Hop 50 celebration, nobody acknowledged Roy Hargrove. And that's what makes it so criminal with this whole, especially with this whole new, the, 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 the New York gatekeeping of hip hop. And the worst part about it was Roy Hargrove made his bones in New York in jazz. Roy Hargrove was the first child of hip hop that was a jazz innovator. Before Roy Hargrove, you had people like M. Tume who were jazz artists who may have done some stuff within, you know, uh, within jazz, Ahmad Jamal, you had jazz artists who came down, Ron Carter, and, com and, and, and composed tracks with hip-hop artists. But they weren't hip-hop. They were from a previous generation. Roy Hargrove was born in 1969, the same year as Puffy. And he was raised hip hop in Dallas, Texas. Raised hip hop. Went to New York to make his way in jazz, then down to Philly. And on his way up, did tracks with the great, my, one of my favorites. Y'all know me, I love Oscar Peterson. If you ask me, my, my favorite song to meditate to is a song called Wave by Oscar Peterson. Look that song up. It's on an album called Motions and Emotions, 1968, where he takes a, a, a bossa nova type sound but plays with his genius piano strokes. Great album. My, one of my favorite pianists. A song called he did with, called Caravan with Dizzy Gillespie, one of my favorite jazz songs to just zone out to. Um, so he did a song with Oscar Peterson one of Oscar Peterson's last albums before he passed away. Roy Hargrove did work with Wynton Marcellus. He did a lot of work in the 90s with your jazz legends. I mean, the absolute legends of jazz, the ones who were still making music at the time. Well, during that time that he was making music with the legends, he was also the key sound, the, the trumpet behind anything Soul Quarian. Anytime you heard a trumpet on, on a Dilla track, when you heard a trumpet on that Soul Quarian sound or with the roots, Jill Scott, Eric Badu, Common, that was Roy Hargrove. Roy Hargrove was the first to really successfully integrate the jazz with the, with the R&B, soul, and hip-hop. Three foundation of Black American art, pure art forms. And he was a part of the, the the genius behind the Soul Query and Neo Soul movement of the late 90s into the early 2000s. Roy Hargrove was essential to that. Essential to Common, rappers like Common. Uh, Dilla's music. And we all know Dilla. How great he is. Was. Rest in peace, Dilla. So rest in peace, Roy Hargrove. Five years now. He died in 2018. And he's such an essential component to rap, especially the kind of rap that I like. I like more conscious, more, you know, I love me some Common. I don't like Common's politics the last 10 years. I don't know what the fuck happened to Common when it comes to the politics. That nigga is a dimmer. That nigga has done, done too disaster for the Democrats, boy. I'm like, God damn, Common, what happened to you? Whatever happened to nigga, let's make whole steps to hotel. Like on the Like Water for Chocolate album. Come on, comment. What the fuck happened to you, my brother? Come on, let's let's get back in the game. Get back to loving black people more than the Democrats. But anyway, Roy Hargrove was essential and he's a very core piece that seamlessly integrated the jazz with the soul with the hip hop. And as long as I live as long as I talk music, I'm never going to let the memory of Roy Hargrove die. So, 
Rest in peace, Roy Hargrove. And that's honor. We we have to honor our ancestors, man. We have to honor our greats. We have so many. <clears throat> that means every day we need to be honoring a new great. Because it's a great black person born 365 days a year. Some days we're going to have to honor two, three, four niggas at a time. Because that's how goddamn great we are. But uh, go ahead, Miriam. I see you down there, Rachel. Bo. Um, indeed, we definitely have to honor our greats, um, the known and the unsung, shall I say, because um, a lot of our musicians and composers and artists, you know, um, we do not honor them. We do not pay the tribute and give them the respect that they deserve and, um, you know, and gatekeep what it is that we have. Um, also, um, you did, you hit Miles Davis, you hit Herbie Hancock, you hit, uh, even Duke Ellington when Janet Jackson was doing, um, All Right With Me. I mean, for goodness sake, he was on the stage. You heard him, you heard his band, you heard those horns? Oh my goodness. And then, um, you also have, um, Patrice Russian, who also integrated jazz into hey, Orange. Mary, Mary. Miriam, I'm yeah. gonna let you cook. I'm gonna let you cook, but you just brought up my girl. Yo, yo, bad, yo, bad for bringing up my girl, Patrice. Oh Patrice my Russian. Let me. I'm gonna say something real quick, and I'm gonna let you cook. Right quick, and then I'm gonna let you do it. Go ahead, go ahead, Miriam. Go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna cook thank on you, love. I'm, go ahead. I'm gonna be quick because I want you to. And, cook. I'm, and I'm gonna let you speak okay. again, but go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, they sit up there and called her Umpiris because she chose to do to sacrifice herself and bring jazz over into R and B. But she was one of the cold coldest innovative um jazz musicians there was. And I'll let you cook, brother. Go on and go on to get it. Patrice Russian, um, Jordan High School, South Central LA. One thing about LA, we don't we really don't be talking about how great we are musically. We really don't. We be letting everybody else talk. And then folks be like, Y'all on the West Coast, y'all don't know. We be like, all right, fine. Because we got beautiful weather and a whole bunch of fine ass women. So we don't give a fuck about what nobody else thinks. So we don't we don't spend too much time bragging about what we do here on the West Coast. But we produced a woman named Patrice Russian out of LA. And if you want to talk about one of the golden jewels of music. Patrice Russian. This woman, do you understand? On her second album, she played every instrument. See, Cats like to act like Prince is the only one. Prince was just the one that talked about it most. And I love Prince. No disrespect to Prince. Prince just, he did the right, he marketed it. He just marketed himself better than everyone else. Sly Stone from Sly the Family Stone. He played every instrument too. We listen to that song, I Wanna Take You Higher. Do no, no, do no, no. Sly Stone is playing every instrument. He just gave credit to his band because he was like, whatever, I don't need credit. Roger Troutman, a lot of that zap stuff, he played every instrument. But so did Patrice Russian, and not just the men, it's the women too. Patrice plays every instrument. And she did it on her album. And one of my favorite songs. If I was at home right now, I'd, I'd, I'd be playing music for y'all, but I'm not at home. Um, one of my favorite songs from Patrice Russian, and I encourage you guys to look it up. It's a song called Where There Is Love. Look that song up. It's a song that I like to sometimes start my day to, or if I'm feeling like a little bit weary, listen to. Because that song says, Where There Is Love, you don't have to worry because where there is you, you'll find love in a hurry. That song is saying, basically, if you're looking for love, love is wherever you are. Love is nothing that you seek. It's nothing that you can find outside of you. Love is something that you have to give yourself and give the world. And through giving yourself love, through showing love, you find love. That's the part that a lot of people miss because in today's world, everybody want to talk about the hater, what haters are doing, what, ooh, everybody hating on me. Look at me. They don't like me. Well, if everybody's hating on you, guess what? If you sing, remember, music is a prayer. 
let's break it all the way down. Then I'm going to get to you, Racing Bro. I appreciate you for joining the room. I got to hear what you got to say, my brother. But um, we got to understand that as a people, music is a prayer. And whatever you sing matched with energy, that's the energy you attract. So if everybody's hating on you, everybody's looking at you funny, if everybody wished they was you, then you gonna if and if you singing that and you putting that prayer out there, well, guess what? You just asked the universe to bring to your environment. Snoop Dogg said it best one time in an interview I heard with him. Is an interview Snoop Dogg had with former NFL running back Arian Foster. Go back and look it up. It's probably like he did it probably like five years ago, and he said that he when he did murder was the case. He ended up having a murder case put on him. And he realized how powerful his words was. And so after he had that murder case, he changed his lyrics up. Back to Patrice Russian. She has so much good, healthy music for your soul. And a song like Where There Is Love, You Won't Have to Worry, because where there is you, you'll find love. I think we all need to hear that because we all get to these spaces where we feel like don't nobody hear us. We get to these spaces in time. And I ain't saying we like this all the time. Well, some of you niggas is depressed. You niggas is like that all the time. You you niggas need to go jog and do some shit to get your spirits up. He <laughs> listen to some Earth and the Fire and Michael Jackson. But if you're not like that all the time, at some point you get like that. And to me, that's one of the most beautifully written songs um, that, I, that I hear. So Patrice Russian, She's also been the music com conductor for the Grammys, for the Oscars. She's composed a lot of music for movies. You talk about a bad bitch. And I use the word bitch the way it was intended. The original intention of the word bitch. Our, our mother star is serious. The star that our red, white, and blue flag is, flag is colored after. The star that Earth and Fire celebrates in the song September. They're celebrating serious. That's known as the dog star, the bitch. The highest of the highest. Say that, brother. The highest of the highest. That's what the bitch is. It's not, nothing get past, not, nothing, not even the king gets past the bitch. And when I use the term, I make sure to use it in that context. Patrice Russian is that bitch. And she's still living. How many of us honor her? Because her core changes, her music has been sampled by hip hop. See, one thing about hip hop, hip hop don't have its own soundtrack. Everything in hip hop borrows from rhythm and blues and everything else. So since hip hop has chosen, well, yeah, some people like Outkast that picked up the instruments and do it on their own, but it's still a rhythm and blues format. Since the majority of hip hop has chosen to sample and not create, then you must give respect to the rhythm and blues composers of the sounds that you rap over. You must. Because if you don't have those rhythm and blues based samples to rap over, then you're just a fucking poet. And nobody listens to poets. We all love Tupac, but I dare you to name five Tupac poems. And he wrote a lot of them. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Miriam, if you want to finish what you got to say, then I'll get to uh, Racer Bro. Miriam, I, I, I know I'll cut you off, Miriam. So if you want to finish what you got to say, go ahead. Oh, no. You know what? It's just always peace and love when you speak, and the vibration is so beautiful. Um, brother, when you start talking about Series A, because there's both a Series A and a Series B, and you better believe it, the dog star, better known as bitch, if they want to put the feminine aspect on it. And I always tell a dude, if you're going to disrespect me saying the word, you better put miss in front of it. You. You're welcome. So there's always been um, that type of um, conscious mindset within myself as far as that word um, goes. But um, you are 100% right. Oh, my goodness. Patricia, Russia, Russia is truly one of the greatest composers 
producers, um, my goodness, um, singers, singer, and definitely um, overall musician. Um, and she has such a beautiful soul. Oh, my God. She's a beautiful woman inside and out. And she always, like, you could just feel her energy. She, she's just love when you look at her, personified. And that's what true femininity is, ladies. Take note. Not all that backbiting, all that sniping at each other. Not that, that Jada Pinkett shit? Not that motherfucking narcissistic, bald-headed, double dog banana back bitch, and I don't mean in a good way, Jada Pickett-Smith. And too many of you motherfuckers out here got that type of bitch spirit. You need an exorcism. But um, on, on some real talk, um, I don't like bitch niggas either. Woo! Let me stop. But um, back to the music. That, um, hey, y'all, need, y'all need to give me that. I I I I hold a six hour Twitter space on bitch ass <laughs> niggas. So don't, let's let's keep going. We we got I'll Razor right. Bowen here. We know he he a real one. So I mean, <laughs> I'll be right there with you. The one you know, I will tag team your girl. Funny for real, for real. I got I got some mm-hmm. hots. Um, but I'm gonna let um, our brother Razor Bow go because I know he got a lot to add to the pot. But peace and love, family, and always it's a pleasure, brother Duan B, to be in your presence, to be part of what you do, and to be here to be a student um, in a lot of what you're teaching. And I, I know I know a lot, but brother, you know a lot. And I'm so happy to see that your documentary is finally coming to um, uh, fruition. For those of y'all who don't know, he been talking about this. He say last year, I say two years, more than that. So, um, cause he kind of threw it out there. Um, uh, I'll, I've been listening to you for a minute. I just, I'm quiet. I like to observe and take in who I'm a, you know, start chatting with and then chime in on what it is that you present. So that's just how I am. Cause I move spirit first, peace and love. And I'll land my plane, dock my ship and park my chair. Thank you. <laughs> much appreciated, Miriam. You, you much appreciate it for real. Yeah, I've been talking about it for about two years now, but it's just that I've never done a documentary before, so I just had to figure out what to do first and then shot it. And then once I shot it, I had to figure out what to do next because I wasn't about to be doing a whole bunch of crowdfunding and shit and not know what the fuck I'm doing. I made all my mistakes on my own dime. That's why it's been, I filmed this thing over a year ago. I was like, yep, no, no, okay, yeah, let me, I done put so much money into this and time. I said, let me let me work these kinks out on my own dime. And when those kinks are worked out, then we're gonna go ahead and put the uh and fund the crowdfund the bigger project. Y'all can y'all can go ahead and assist at thewanbe.com. I got both the GoFundMe link up and also the live stream pay-per-view. Please join that live stream pay-per-view. You do not want to miss that. Too, I got you, you hear? I got you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, join that live stream pay-per-view because it's going to be some information that y'all definitely going to want to ask me some questions on. So, yeah. But uh, next up, my man, Race the Boat. Go ahead, my brother. Yo, peace. Down, peace, man. everybody. Peace, Dewan. Can y'all hear me? Yeah, yes, peace, sir. brother. Um, I just want to say um, kudos and congratulations on you coming out with your document- documentary on our, our, our music culture, brother. It's definitely needed. And um, you said something which was very important earlier that – um. You know, you and Tariq's uh, uh, documentaries, they do not step on each other's toes. They're really about two different subjects, but it's all encompassing our culture as far as uh, the music world is concerned. Um, what actually brought me to the stage is that, you know, I, I kind of came in the room when y'all were discussing the issue of about, uh, you know, who was credited with uh, the scratch, you know, whether it was Herbie Hancock, Flash, or Grand Wizard Theodore. Um... Here's the thing, right? And and I'm not and I'm not sitting here trying to perpetuate the argument. And I agree with you, Dewan. It is a in my in my opinion as well. It is a silly argument. But um, if you understand, hey, I don't know. No. I want to make it real mm-hmm. clear, real quick, mm-hmm. because I want because I I, I, I kind of spoke a little fast. It's a silly more argument in the context of Herbie Hancock. Like leave him out of it. Now, as far as who was first, then no, I think it should be we should know who did it first. You know what I mean? As far as that goes. It was only to me. It was only a silly argument in the context of people getting mad at Herbie Hancock for putting scratching it on the record. That's that's the point of view I was saying it's silly from. But outside of that, now nah, we got to know who did it. I, I'm, I'm with you. Okay, now clear. Now, all right, cool. So, but so I'm glad you cleared that up for me. 
Um, so it, it, it changes my view. It was it changes what I'm going to say a little bit. So if that's the case, um, well, let, let me just say what I got to say anyway. Um, go ahead, go ahead. All right, because <laughs> because the, the thing is, is that brother, um, uh, like uh, the reason why Herbie Hancock gets thrown in the pot, and um, and believe it or not, even as far as New York, it's never really been an argument. It's always been credit, credited to Grand Wizard Theater. I'm gonna tell you why. Um, what I think that a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of people don't know about New York culture is that we had one thing that actually exists today that always existed, damn near since the inception of hip hop. But I I just simply credit it to the mid seventies. We always had the mixtape scene. I think Tariq is actually going to get into a, a deep history in that when he puts out his documentary about hip hop. Um, we've been passing around mixtapes, especially out around New York since the mid seventies. So um, and 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 here's the kicker. Um, my uncle, he actually has the, the park jam um, where Grand Wizard Theodore is scratching. I believe this is 77, 78. And um, one thing about people don't understand about New York culture, a lot, so much, so much, so much historical great moments have simply just been lost in the echoes and the trees of the parks. So um, believe it or not, if you want to catch the real greatness, you really have to talk to those guys who got the mixtapes. I, I believe I personally have that mixtape at my grandfather's house, but I would literally have to go down there and sit through hours. I would have to pull out a tape deck and I would literally have to let, let sit there and go through hours and hours and hours and hours of tape just to find out that, that, that segment where uh, Grand Wizard Theodore was rocking 23 Park in the Bronx. Um, um, and, and it, which brings me back to that point. Like I said, a lot of our, 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 a lot of these great events get lost in the park. And what I mean by that is that this, I, I, I'll make up a scenario for you. Let's just say Grand Grand uh, Grandmaster Flash is booking in the 23 Park over there by Forest Projects in the South Bronx. It's, it's, it's old time is there. We out there jamming. Now, I'm going to take you back to the 70s. Somebody got the tape recorder hooked up to the mic, hooked up to the system, recording this brother doing his thing. Now, the way the park jams work, you don't know who would pull up, especially back then without any internet access or any cell phone access. You wouldn't, you don't know who might have pulled up. So we could have been in there jamming, just doing our thing. Let's just say Melly Mel steps in the park. You don't know. Kumo D might have been sitting on the bench across the street and said, yo, they over there jamming. Oh, let me go over there and make my presence felt. So now you got Meg Grandmaster, um, you got, um, you got uh, uh, Melly Mel versus uh, 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 Kumo D. Uh, uh, or with, with, with uh, uh, Grandmaster Flash sitting there on the turntables jamming in the park that you might only be able to hear on a mixtape. And if it wasn't for that person recording that particular mixtape, which was like our live concert tapes at the beginning, if he didn't encompass that or catch that, it would just be lost in time forever. And nobody would, except the people who were there, would know, ever know that that whole session existed. So... To bring my point back to the scratch, there are actually mixtapes, and you just have to talk to them brothers who from the seventies kept on to the mixtapes. That when you have actually had Rambers and Theodore scratching out of his mind, I believe one of the jams was called "Itching for a Scratch," and this is what's like I said in the seventies, predating uh, Rocket. Now, the reason why Herbie Hancock gets so much flack is because, um, if I'm not mistaken, Herbie Hancock was already a known musician. Also, as far as New York culture, we're very petty. In case anybody <laughs> haven't learned that about New York, cats, we're extremely petty. So, you know, which goes into a, a lot of the bickering back and forth anyway. But also um, that um, how people felt about Herbie was that, yo, brother, you wasn't in those park jams and, 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 and none of these, uh, 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 you know, holding the walls really making your bones, you know, you, so how people feel was like, yo, you heard that scratch on the mixtape, you ran to the studio, you perfected it or put your gloss on it, put it out to the world as if, and I'm like, and I like, I, and then what you said, everybody said true, he never took credit for it, for it, but once again, it's, it just felt like a, a, a jack move to the, to the people who should have been uh, attributed, you know, the credit for, you know, at least innovating that particular um, source sound. And then, uh, and then, uh, just to switch subjects real quick, I just wanted to make that be known as far as the argument with Herbie Hancock, Grandmaster Flash. I'm, I'm gonna let you cook, but I wanna, I wanna take, go, ahead, bro. go back to that point before you, got it, you go to the next brother. point, all right? Uh, and salute to FBA interest, uh, interest, Miss G. I'm just not seeing y'all up in the chat room, uh, down there. Uh, salute to y'all, crypto. But to that point, and again, that's why I'm saying, like, the New Yorkers had it all wrong. See, Herbie. He was in the trenches in New York too, just two decades prior. 
the only way you get to be in Miles Davis's band and in, in, in Donald Byrd's band is by being in the trenches. Now, was he in the trenches when it came to rap and hip hop? No, because he already served his time. And it was through serving his time in the trenches. See, hip hop culture is black culture. There's nothing new to hip hop. And this isn't to you, uh, brother. This is like the, just the overall point of view when it comes to the subject in general. What was going on in rap as far as the gatekeeping? Well, Bebop was the same. If you wanted to be, if you wanted to be a known as a Bebop musician, Bebop, although it started in Kansas City. Uh, with Bird and Dizzy, the scene moved to New York by the time you get to the 60s. It was in the 50s it was in Kansas City. It gets to New York, it gets to, it gets to, it gets to New York in the 60s and late 50s, late 50s. And if you want to be a master bebop musician, you got to go to the Cotton Club in Harlem. You got to go to Savoy. You got to go to the trenches. And you got to... It was, ex it was, I'm glad you brought that up, Bracer Bowl, because it was the exact same culture, meaning it could be a jam on the corner and Dizzy Gillespie we could pull up. It could be at a random bar. It, it may not have been in the parks all the time. Sometimes it were in the parks. They, they did definitely play in parks, subway stations. But most of the time it was in the bars because that's where you, you couldn't get a grand piano to a park. But it'll be somebody playing. The next thing you know, Dizzy Gillespie shows up. Miles Davis shows up. Charlie Parker may get off one of his drug binges and show up out of nowhere. Max Roach on the drum. And people who we look at as all-time gods, they were just in New York partying on a jam. And that's where the who is who in the sound is found out. See, Miles Davis came to New York, wanted to be a bebop, Musician. He wanted to play bebop on the trumpet. His inspiration was Dizzy Gillespie. He wanted to play those hard hitting, fast phrasing. <laughs> what Miles found out was although, yes, he could play it, that wasn't his shit. It was too much. So Miles Davis left New York and came to LA and created a whole new genre of jazz called Cool Jazz in an album he released called Birth of the Cool. That brought in what we now know as that Kenny G style, that radio, that the, what you listen to when you kind of, that, that work music, that elevator music. That's all an extension of Cool Jazz. Miles Davis created that sound after he realized bebop wasn't his style. So, the literal culture our brother Racer Bro just said about what was going on in the parks and how cool Modi could show up, how this person could show up, was no different than 20, 30 years prior in New York City when it came to the jazz clubs. Also in Newark, New Jersey. They would also go over to Newark. We gotta give Newark his credit because they would they would hop that bridge and go and 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 and, and do some stuff in Newark. And and so it's that's that that's how he shows he shows black culture. Herbie already been through the trenches. He ain't gotta reprove himself to a whole bunch of niggas trying to prove themselves. That's where hip hop was out of line. Hip hop, and that's because culturally, we've kind of been on our on our heels on our on upside down, and that's a cultural mistake that we've had as black Americans, and we gotta acknowledge that cultural mistake. We have a lot of cultural mistakes. If we didn't have so many cultural mistakes, we wouldn't be in the position that we're in. Part of the reason why we're in the position we're in is because of a lot of, a lot of mistakes we make. That all is an extension of white supremacy. We all understand where it comes from, but we also understand there are certain things we can do to combat it when the white supremacists ain't around. And one of those things is culturally for the older generation to respect and love and acknowledge the younger generation. And for the younger generation to know that the old generation know a little bit some more than we know. The hip hop fucked up when they dismissed Herbie Hancock because he sacrificed himself for that. And the whole thing about him not being in the trenches, he's an elder. He's not supposed to be in the trenches. Shouldn't no 40 year old nigga be in the trenches? The trenches for niggas in their teens and 20s. You better not be in no goddamn trenches in your goddamn 40s. 
you done fucked up if you sit in the trenches and you're 49 goddamn years old. This is telling the whole truth. And so that's where culturally we as a people got to get a better understanding, understanding and know that hip hop is an extension of black culture. It's nothing new. And everything that's going on in hip hop now, I can show you how it went on in the blues, how it went on in country, how it went on in jazz, rhythm and blues, funk, disco, and every other goddamn form of music black Americans create. Um, but I wanted to get that in before uh, you, you, you went to your next point. Uh, go ahead, uh, uh, finish, go to, uh, finish out your point, brother. No, I appreciate you, man. It actually ex expands my point because, um, Brandon, I, 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 like I said, I, I'm, um, me personally, I, I love Herbie Hancock, bro. Uh, I think he's, I, I, you know, I, I think you know he's genius, genius musician. Um, but once again, um, you have to understand the 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 atmosphere of the time we're talking about. We're talking about the beginning of hip hop where people don't understand once again, and I and this might be a New York nuance that people just don't understand because they weren't up here or weren't part of the culture of New York City. I'm not talking about black culture. But the thing was is that uh hip hop was bastardized at the beginning, you know, which you know kind of where hurt comes in at because you know, hip hop wasn't accepted in the jazz club, the disco club, the funk club, the art it was not accepted, not the dress, not the music. You get what I'm saying? So here you have, and, and I'm just talking about the, the point of view, and I'm not agreeing with it, but I'm just, you know, bringing it out. Um, so here you have a a, a, a brother who's a, a an accomplished musician prior to hip hop. Now you got these young cats on the scene doing their thing in hip hop. And, they, and, and granted, like I said, I, I agree Herbie was trying to give ex exposure to the culture. And, you know, people actually took it and looked at it like well we have we got to know it looked like a boule bite you get what i'm saying like you you not on you 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 wasn't embracing hip-hop prior to you doing rocket which it seemed like from a lot of people who might have not been in uh herbie circles so it was like wait well, all right you were you a jazz musician bro you know and it says another thing people also got to know about new york history especially when it comes to the to, to the to the to the uh to the, to, the, to the neighborhoods within the inner cities of the city to where we didn't have no instruments. All of the music programs from the early 70s were stripped out of the public school system as far as uh, uh, the inner cities in the Bronx and, and, and Brooklyn and et cetera. Um, you, might, you might be able to Quick be question. in the music program. Quick question. That, yeah. That's the point that I talked about before you got in here. Around mm -hmm. what around what year did you start seeing the music get taken out taken out in New York? Was it late sixties or was it in the early seventies? According according to uh, my uncle and my grandfather, they started stripping those particular programs out of the uh, 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 public school system early to mid seventies, sometime between seventy two and seventy five. That and, and I'm, I'm I'm gonna let you keep going. And right there, that right there is the is the genesis as to why hip hop took off in New York first. Because music got taken from New York first. Like in the early 70s, music is still abundant in Ohio, Detroit, L.A., these other cities. Learning how to play an instrument, you can still learn in school up in, up through the 80s in some, in some cities, you know? Uh, sometimes, some places, the 90s. But for the most part, through the 80s in other cities, you can still learn an instrument in the public school system. That whole stripping of the music in the public school system, that shit started with, with New York. And, and again, it's not y'all fault, nigga. Y'all some dope ass niggas. So, okay, you're not gonna teach me an instrument. I'm gonna scratch some fucking records. Uh, it's always a response to technology, and that's the point that I made in my documentary. But go ahead, brother. Yeah, dude. That I mean, but well, that was the case. So, wait, where you had? So it kind of seemed like you you got somebody coming from a a privileged place, and I'm just talking about from the outside looking in. It seems like you got somebody coming from a, pri pr a privileged place who's an accomplished musician who's taking the off form that we're not saying he can't embrace it, but it, it seems like it wasn't embraced prior to it becoming popular or beginning to become popular. Now, here you take our sound, you put it on the record and you make it popular, but then yet you don't necessarily clarify. You get what I'm saying? At the time, you know, what this, what, what it's about. You kind of, it, it seems like it was just a presentation where I'm like, yeah, this is what I've done and this is the sound I'm bringing. So, like I said, it just seemed like a a a a a, a, a big bite. Now I'm just gonna um, and now I just wanted to end this about you know giving flowers to people who don't get their flowers. 
as far as hip hop concerned. Now, me, my personal favorite producer of all time is a brother named Larry Smith uh, out of Hollis, Queens. Now, for those who don't know who Larry Smith is, he was a funk and jazz musician who wound up actually trans uh, doing that transition that Dewan B was talking about to the electrical sound. And he's actually responsible for the sound uh, of Run DMC and Houdini in particular, and at times the Fat Boys. And um, I always like to give Larry Smith his credit because, one, he's FBA, and he and I believe that's why he doesn't get his credit as a producer. But not only that, um, believe it or not, he's actually, in my opinion, he's actually responsible for the, uh, how can I say, the, the mainstream hip-hop sound. Not only that, he definitely took what would be, uh, you know, considered the Grinch and the and, 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 and the dirt on the diamond. He took it and wiped it off and glossed it and gave uh, hip hop a crisp, clean, electronic sound. Not only that, um, if you actually listen to uh, the beginning of hip hop and more of the earlier mixtapes and records, the majority of the records were typically uh, 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 brothers emceeing over disco breakbeats. Um, that brother actually, you know, com composed and conformed a sound that ha had absolutely no samples, had uh, absolutely no traces of any um, live instruments, but he was definitely able to take that uh, science of live instrumentation and trans tr transform it into a hip hop sound and an electronic sound. So I just wanted to give that brother his flowers uh, real quick. And um, I kind of land my plane on that, brother. But if you need insight, that. I'm here, bro. I appreciate that, bro, because I'm, I'm glad you brought up Larry Smith because on the West Coast, at a young age, out of all the East Coast sounds, Houdini was the first one I was attracted to. And, there, like, Houdini was, I, re I remember as a kid, one love. I mean, when you, when we'd be sitting sit on the porch as a young man, as a, as a boy, all, of, all the niggas who had sound systems was playing Houdini. It was just that original. And Houdini's also in Larry Smith. There's always been a point that I brought up when it comes to everyone trying to trying to narrow hip hop down to a break beat and a scratch and a DJ. And my response to, to them is always, okay, well, explain Houdini. If hip hop is just a break beat and a scratch, then explain to me Houdini. Because they were part of those early years of, and Larry Smith of hip hop. But it was a completely original sound. That's why I, I, earlier when I made the point about scratching, I limited what I said. I said there are plenty of artists. Outcast was one. Houdini's another one that did completely original music. But when it comes to hip hop, let's just tell the truth. That's more the exception than the rule. And um, another point you made about the sound about like Herbie. That's why my documentary is so important. Because I'm doing something ain't nobody else done before. I'm I'm showing the family of black music. This is a family. And the reason why New Yorkers may have taken it that way when it comes to jazz is because they're ignorant as to what, not just them, all, a lot of us are, as to what jazz is and where it comes from. It's like most most of us are. I had a conversation um, on this show, this, this podcast I used to do um, called Craig Facts. Um, they still do the. I'm not on that show anymore. But back when that show, it, it at one time it was a, it was an extremely popular show on YouTube. And when it back in the days when it was an extremely popular show on YouTube, we interviewed a uh, one day in particular. We interviewed um his name. Yeah, I remember um Bo uh Bo Rock uh Bo Rock from um uh, from um what's the name of that group. Summertime in the LBC. I know the name of the group. I'm drawing a blank. Um, Dove Shack. Dove Shack. That's the LBC. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Bo Rock from the from the Dove Shack scene. That was from the show soundtrack, right? Yeah. You, Miss Mrs. L. Um, welcome, my co-host, Mrs. L. I'm, I'm glad you're here. Um, hey, I'm what's up, Mrs. Right. L? I'm gonna get to you as soon as I make this point, Mrs. L. You don't get to speak, and then we gonna kick hey, you to everybody else. But um, so after I speak for everyone in the chat room, after I speak, Mrs. L is going to speak. And then um, everyone else is going to speak. Keep your comments to two minutes or less. I let Racer Bo go because Racer Bo always, that nigga be teaching me shit. So I'm going to let that nigga go. 
and uh, Miss Giselle can go, but everyone else keep your, keep your comments like two minutes or less. But going back to what I was just saying about, ah, uh, oh, god damn it, I just lost my fucking point. Um, ah, shit. What was I just talking no, right. about? Huh? Yeah, you were talking about that summertime in the LBC song. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, anyway, I was talking to Bo Rock. And he, before the interview started, he was talking about jazz. And he was talking about how, like, jazz was his sophisticated form. And the people of the jazz age don't understand hip hop. And I also had the same conversation with Gorilla Black before I started when we interviewed him. A similar conversation with Gorilla Black. And when I was trying to tell the brothers, and they understood after that was a conversation, I said, all black music is ghetto hood music. Jazz is a hood than a motherfucker. Jazz is probably more hood than hip hop. Here's the reason why. Hip hop grew up on food stamps and Section A housing and guaranteed cheese Guaranteed food. May not have had much money, but she was going to eat. Hip-hop grew up under those. Yes, hip-hop grew up under the war on drugs and Reaganomics and Nixon. Yes, that's true. But hip-hop was always going to have a warm, hot meal because of government programs. No matter how bad mama fucked up, you can get to somewhere with some kind of a program and a warm, hot meal. Jazz didn't grow up under those circumstances. Jazz grew up under no social safety net, no minimum wage. Either you, it wasn't an option between selling drugs and making a lot of money over here rapping. No, it was an option between being a fucking sharecropper, picking cotton 14 to 16 hours a day, or get good on that trumpet. Niggas need to have some fucking respect for jazz. For Charlie Parker, for Duke Ellington, for Louis Armstrong. Do you guys know when Jelly Roll Morton was creating, when he brought, before Jelly Roll Martin, Morton brought jazz to the West Coast out of New Orleans? And at the age of eight, he played the piano and looked through a peephole in a whorehouse. And he played the piano to the rhythm of the stroke of the tricks as an eight-year-old. Eight-year-old. Louis Armstrong, the father of all music in America, had to open up that trumpet case because his mom wasn't around and played that trumpet. And he only ate if people threw enough pennies and nickels in his trumpet case, there was no social safety net. There was no shelter to go to. Hell, there was no even gangs to go to because black people were too busy fucking sharecropping to create gangs. That's what jazz grew up under. Much harsher circumstances than hip hop. But because those men and women, Ella Fitzgerald, she had to raise herself. Her mother, her parents died young. Ella Fitzgerald was on the streets by the age of 11 and had to make her way because there was no social safety net to save her. Same thing with Billie Holiday. So we look back on these greats and we see how beautifully they dressed. We see how shiny their hair was. We see how they smiled and got along. And we look at them and be like, they don't understand. When we don't understand, we ain't got shit on what they went through. And it's very important that in this documentary that I point that out, that black Americans, we are under racism, oppression, white supremacy. And no, not one generation had it good. Not one. My generation didn't have it good. 
Our parents' generation didn't have it good. Our great, great, great grandparents, no one had it good. We all had relative amounts of freedom, but wasn't nobody free. And we got to have that respect, and that story must be told. But I got to get to Miss Giselle. I invited her up. I didn't even know you was down there because you ain't got no goddamn profile picture. You're just black. I just saw Miss G. <laughs> You know, anytime I'm talking about music, you're always welcome, and I I, I totally 100,000% appreciate your perspective. So I'm going to get to Conscious and whoever's next after you, but I want you to uh, say what you got to say because, yes, you get to skip to the front of the line because you missed Giselle. But go ahead. Hilarious. Hey, Dewan. And hey, everybody. I'm glad you hosted this space, and I'm glad we keep pumping and beating the drum on who created what. I'm so surprised that Pete Rock, considering the fact that if you listen to, like, even down to his instrumental album that he did in, like, the early 2000s, those instruments actually tapped into all of our historic sounds. Um, He tapped into that, and that's what he brought to the light. I know he's Heavy D's cousin. I don't even know if he's half us or not. But um, we know Heavy D is from the island. His family's from the island. Yeah, he's full Jamaican. He's full oh, Jamaican. Yeah. Him, him and Heavy. Yeah. Yeah. So, and see, Pete, like, he's coming up here. All of these people that sat in the background and became friends of the people in this, you know, this movement. Um, and If you look back in the day, they didn't have the same energy that they bring in right now when it comes to who created this, because it wasn't a question at first. Now it's like, I think a lot of our people have been neutralized in the music industry. Um, and plus not only that mainstream wasn't the thing when it, for hip hop, because even like a lot of you guys said earlier, hip hop was not a popular sound to, I remember back in the day for us to even listen to hip hop like that. We had to listen to, it was like Friday night. Um, they would play it or they would have rap attack. Like we had, we, it was certain times that they played hip hop. Other than that, the sound on the radio was R&B and that pop sound. And then they was trying to do the crossover um, music even before they elevated hip hop. So I feel like uh, um, a lot of these people, they're just trying to insert themselves is absolutely a bag to be gotten. That's going to be um, surfacing next year. And if, because we're in front of it and we're the creators of it, they have to pay homage to us in these spaces. And everybody wants that limelight and they don't have any reflections um, to support it. Um, I think it's important for us to keep standing on this. And I believe that across this entire country, I think everyone, when all of these documentaries drop, we need to have watch parties and make that shit popular online. Um, all of these um, musicians, we need to have events celebrating our artists, whether they're like local artists or, um, you know, if you can bring in a celebrity artist, that'd be dope. But really just really focusing back on our underground because that's where the sound is still jumping and it's evolving in another way. I think more so like uh, jazz hip hop is really popularizing um, because people like the band with people rapping to the music. Hey, Mrs. Zell, and I'm not about, I'm not, I'm going to let you, no, you keep go ahead. I'm glad you brought that up because I keep forgetting to bring up the night. A night. Um, next month, me and Tashina Arnold got a live music night that we're going to be doing here in L.A. Uh, Tashina going to be singing. I'm going to be hosting Cracking Jokes. And yes. we got And we got some, we're going to be having some for real, for real name singers coming through. And we're also going to be showcasing new and upcoming singers and, up and upcoming conscious rappers, the ones who do it over a live beat. Now, I'm glad you brought that up and I'm going to let you keep cooking because you just brought up a point. That's why I'm glad y'all brought you up here. You brought up a point that I've been trying to bring up the last two hours and kept forgetting to bring up. The rappers that rap over a live beat. Anderson yeah. Pack. Anderson Pack is at the front of that. You got um you got here in LA, I see that all the time. You got Butcher Brown. There's a band called Butcher Brown. Look them up. I don't know if y'all heard of them. They're, but they're out of the Carolinas. Um, but the lead, that nigga can rap, play the trumpet, and the saxophone. And first of all, in what world do niggas play the trumpet and the saxophone? A brass and a woodwind? Usually you either play a woodwind or a brass. You usually don't play both. This nigga plays both great and he raps and he's dope as fuck. 
go check out Butcher Brown if you're ever in town. I there's a show I saw them last year, and they actually opened up for Ronnie Laws, and then they actually were the cover played the band and played play Ronnie Laws the music for him. But anyway, there's a whole scene of rappers, ter- well, uh, hip hop and rap here in, in, in here on the West Coast. That's been cracking here on the West Coast for about a little over ten years now because, um, Death Row, Snoop, Dre, Up and Smoke tour, they started taking Kamaski Washington, Terrace Martin, the current crop of jazz, the, the 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 people pushing jazz forward, got their start through uh the Up and Smoke tour, uh through hip hop. It's crazy how that how it works, you know, right? Hip hop got to the top, but I don't know how it works. That's why we got to expand the conversation past New York, because over here on the West, what hip hop did was it fit the careers of the punk musicians, Charlie Wilson, Steve Arrington, Roger Troutman, brought them in as producers on the on the on the hip hop, and then when the young cats came, Terrace Martin, Kamasi Washington, Thundercat, it gave them jobs as teenagers to go on tour playing hip hop and the money that those cats saved up Thundercat, Flying Lotus they c- recorded their own music and they are and Kamasi Washington revolutionized jazz and brought in DJ Battle Cat to be on the on the on the on the albums and those cats between those cats uh, and, and it's different scenes popping up all across the country where you got musicians here in LA Nipsey Nipsey was 60s, and um, the Barbara Morrison Theater, uh, where Kamasi and all them would be, that's in 40s hood. 40s and 60s never got along. Never got along. Never got along. But whenever Kamasi and them would be up in Hollywood or somewhere else in neutral grounds, it was nothing to see Nipsey show up and rap over these cast music. There's a reason why Kendrick Lamar on the on the album To Pimp a Butterfly, the whole West Coast jazz scene that I'm talking about, those are the guys. On that song, This Dick Ain't Free, that's Tomasi playing the sax. That's Thundercat that produced the song If These Walls Can Talk. And Thundercat is known worldwide as probably the coldest, baddest bass player moving the instrument or the electric bass forward uh, with his two bass setup. And that's all coming out of here at L.A., they all went to the, they went to the same high school as who? Patrice Rushington. I said Rushington. Patrice Rushington. Jordan High. We were talking about her earlier. Kamasi went to Hamilton. But yeah, there's a whole scene. And when I go to these shows, and I'm gonna get back to your point, Mrs. L, then I'll get to the next person. I'm at these shows. I'm a concert going ass nigga. Y'all be seeing with ah as many posts and pictures I put up of me being at concerts. Y'all know I don't post every picture I'm at a concert. I'm always around music. When I'm around these, a lot of these like rappers, what Mr. Zell was just talking about, rappers that are doing over a live beat, with when they do shows here in LA, man, them hoes be packed. They be packed. These motherfuckers got followers too. It ain't no media cameras pat following them around. They're not gonna get mentioned like Drake, but these niggas doing like live music rap, they have followings. That Gen Z group, when I when I go to jazz concerts now, I'm 42. I'm used to be, I'm used to being the youngest because I've been going to me and my wife been going to jazz concerts since I was 18. We was 18. I'm 42 now. When I go to these jazz concerts, I'm an old nigga. Oftentimes now, I'm used to being the young nigga. Why? Because when I went to go see Butcher Brown, the rapper that plays the saxophone and trumpet, the majority of the crowd was in their 20s. And to make it even bigger than that, they all knew who Ronnie Laws was. How many hip hop niggas know who Ronnie Laws is? Or the Laws family, Hubert Laws' his brother, or his sister Deborah Laws, one of the greatest families in music history. These cats in their 20s knew who the fuck they were. Because there's this thing in LA called Jazz is Dead, and it's produced by Adrian Young and Ali Shaheed Muhammad. Ali Shaheed Muhammad from Five Car Quest. They got a whole bunch of jazz albums that they that they they done with legends, and they produce this uh, once a month, twice a month, jazz thing here in L.A. And the crowd is thirty five and under. 
it's a whole thing going on that the news ain't talking about. And if you in LA, y'all gonna wanna attend this live music show that I got. It's me and Tashina Arnold. You know, Tika, she could sing her motherfucking ass off. We was in Philly together this past weekend with her singing. And we're gonna be having all kinds of surprise guests come through. I'm gonna have top name comedians coming through. And it's gonna be a whole music vibe because I'm not just talking about it. I'm talking about it on Twitter Spaces with you guys. I got a documentary coming out, but I also got a, a room because I don't want to just talk about this shit. I want to at least provide a space and place for the rappers who are conscious, for the singers who can sing, and for the musicians who want to play. So that's all coming in November. But get your pay-per-view tickets first for November 12th. November 12th, November 12th, November 12th, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m., I'm going to premiere my, 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 my documentary and I would love for you guys to be a part of it so we can fund the full series of this shit. All right. But go ahead, Ms. Giselle, make your point. Um, yeah. Say? No, and that's the new wave, but they're trying to silence it because they see it as a monetary opportunity. So for the, they know that this is going to be a monetary opportunity, so they don't want us to be attracted to it. Once we're attracted to it, we're attracted to it for decades. Or we just never let it go. Kind of like um, R&B. Um, so what they're doing, because they're trying to pre pretty much exile us out of the music genres. And anything that we create, they try to over, like, pretend as if they came up with it first. That's why they still want all eyes on us. That's why they stay in our spaces lurking to hear and see whatever the next best thing is. But hip-hop jazz is jumping. We have it here. Like when pe when they have the club nights here, everyone is out rocking off and it's the best experience and it's all age ranges. And that's because we're just ready to for evolution in music. So that's really the reason why they're silencing it because the music hip hop is now evolving once again and they can't keep up with it. They just finally figured out how to deal with the last version of it after, um, um, what is it diluting it but yeah we could go to the hands I know Conscious it came up he was next and then Miriam um, Willie and then um, Shanky thank you very much I'm hitting the timer on my shit uh, two minutes I can't hear did somebody say something? I couldn't hear anything. Oh, I, I, I'm, 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 at, I, I'm at 143 huh? seconds. I, I'm on my timer. I said I got two minutes, right? Hey. I can hear you, Mr. Zell. Can you hear the guy talking conscious? No, I can't hear him. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Conscious. Can you drop down and come back up? Yeah, I'm yeah I can. I'm going to come back up. I'll let you speak. We can come back up. Okay. So you want to go to the next hand, Dwan, and then... Um, Willie Dynamite, if it's quick, then I'm going to get right back to Conscious. Go ahead. Okay. Is it on me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to speak on the, um, you know, change gears real quick and talk about this S uh, West Coast, East Coast stigma. Um, because I had heard this conversation go around a lot as far as... Um, embracing hip-hop period coming from other places <clears throat> now speaking for the foundational black american community in new york we never never had that stigma even in the thick <clears throat> i mean we never had that uh, outlook rather even in the thick of uh the so-called east coast west coast thing we always embraced uh hip-hop from other places Bro, Lee, so no. Hey, 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 what up, conscious? Oh, you, oh, oh my bad. Y'all want to get conscious? Let's go. I, I, I'll, I'll yeah. yeah. Let, let conscious go ahead and cut. Let my team. All right, you got it. All right, right on. I'm hitting my uh, st I'm hitting my time right now. There you go. Two minutes. Okay. So, P. Rock says seventy percent of the founders of hip hop are Jamaican. I still can't hear him, but go ahead. Y'all go ahead. I, I hear it on the replay. Go ahead. Yeah. Pete Rock says 70% of the founders of hip-hop are Jamaican. True. Mm, that's false. They reminisce over you, my God. All right. 
Let's keep going. So this has been a very interesting conversation. Um, Duan B, when you replay this, I know you can hear what I'm saying. I support you 100%. I appreciate you, sir. Uh, thank you for this space. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, Y'all been chopping it up real deep in this space. And I just want everybody to understand that we have to gatekeep our culture. We have to let people understand that we know who we are, even if you don't know who we are. We know who we are. Know yourself, and you know your enemy. Okay? So, um, it's really, you know, it, it took me so long to get up here. I had my hand up for so damn long. I done damn lost my whole fucking point. God damn. All right. Outlaw Media Time Check. Hey, it's a uh, 11. It's a uh, 1 11 Eastern Standard Time, 12 11 Central Standard Time, 11 11 Mountain Standard Time, 10 11 Pacific Standard Time, Outlaw Media Time Check. ConsciousOutlawMedia.com. I had to ho put a whole commercial in here, but I support Don B. Dewan B, I support him and everything that he does. Um, it's people in this space that wouldn't have came in here if it wasn't for me. So, so I got a couple more minutes. I got like a whole other minute. So, um, oh wow, I'm getting down. Oh, hey, God, get, yeah, because you're not saying nothing, nigga. Oh, oh, what you want me to say? I don't know about the topic. You. You got a whole commercial going. Okay, so 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 my commercial. So at the end of the day, my commercial was saying, "Mr. Dewan B got some real shit going on." And okay, you finished? No, no, I'm not finished. Nah, I'm Nicole. No, Nicole. No, Nicole. No, Nicole. I'm not finished. I'm not finished, Nicole. Go ahead and finish out loud, but you're not supposed to plug yourself. But go ahead, brother. <sighs> All right. Hey, go ahead, go ahead. I'm, I, I can hear you now. Go ahead and wrap it up. We'll get on to the next person. All right. So, uh, this is a good space. This is um, what you're doing is good. I support you. I appreciate you. I'm going to push you. When I have uh, uh, available funds, I'm going to support you. Or you go fund me. And uh, that's really all I got to say because I know you're doing some real shit. If you follow me or you not, you see that I retweet you and I support you. It don't take a lot for a nigga to hit that re retweet button. It really don't. So I support what you're doing, Mr. DeWine B. I, I support all of your movement. I support the real movement, the real grassroots, because I'm the real grassroots. ConsciousOutlawMedia.com. I'm dropping out. All right. Good one, brother. Go ahead. Um... Rest of both, finish your point, then I'm going to uh, Miriam, 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 then the Shanky. All right, cool. Thanks, man. Um, Yeah, I, like I was saying about the East Coast, West, West Coast, uh, that, that's that's a whole myth. Um, You know, the FBA community, we always embraced uh, hip-hop coming from other places. Like, um, you know, I, 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 my uncle was bumping Public Enemy and NWA at the same time. We was bumping Ice-T, Scooty, D. We was bumping all of that. <clears throat> as long as it was hard and it was hitting. And um, and believe it or not, it, it um, one time in the city, um, how the music used to get judged, at least from what I saw, was coming up. Like, if the shit made you di do a diddy bop when you heard it, if that shit made you pop your head, rock your shoulders, like yo, I got, I got to get down to this. It it it, 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 it was a rap, especially if you came with some cold lyrics on top of on top of the track. It was, it, it, it that was enough for us. <laughs> that, that a lot of that um. That bullshit always got pushed by, um, you know, the 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 the, the white supremacist media. I, 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 in my in my opinion, that's another form just to separate us, have us bickering about something that we was never bickering about in the first place, and then, then they capitalize um capitalize off of it like they always do. <clears throat> so I just want you know want people to understand that that was never uh, New York's as far as our community outlook. That always came that, but I noticed that always came from a lot of industry heads. Uh, that always came <clears throat> from a lot of people who you, you'll start to notice that are compromised by the uh, um, the big machine. But um, I'm pretty sure the one, even if you talk to a lot of those West Coast artists, some of them tell you that when they was, especially when they was trying to get their foot off, of, uh, you know, some of the first places they was getting love might have been New York City, and this is stuff I've seen personally. And then you had even certain artists 
you know, after the fact that was coming out here touching ground, I mean, really touching the streets and moving around. And I've seen this, like Nipsey Hussle, he was running around with them Lake Book Mafia Crips when he first touched down. Jerry Curl dripping, Chuck Taylor's on, all of that. Like, really touching the scene with dudes. Mac 10, he was running around in Brooklyn. He was running around, you know, over there in Forest Projects, pulling up on Trinity Ave, like, like, like really doing this. So, um, you know, all of that, yo, uh, New York dudes never fuck with this one and that one because of where they from. Oh, we never embrace the music. That shit is a whole fucking industry lie. And I just want people to really understand that. That's all. Now, I appreciate you for clearing that up, my brother. Miriam, uh, make it quick since you spoke already. Then we're going to get to Shanky. Thank you. Um, whew, a lot was said. Um, but um, I wanted to get back to like um, sisters like Ella Fish Gerald. Um, when you talk about scratching, um, you know, the instrument, the um, needle on the um, record or the album, um, typically the album, um, no one scattered or did the sound of scatting the way that sister did um, quite like she did. And to me, she used her vocals in that sense. And um, also, there was just a lot said. So I'm just going to say this and land my plane. Um, I'm looking forward um, to seeing um, my FBA kings move forward with these wonderful documentaries because we need it on all sides. Salute to you, Brother Dewan B. Salute to Brother Tariq Nasheed because it's needed. What you two are doing is epic. And that is gatekeeping in the right way. And um, shout out to you, Miss Giselle, how beloved. And um, FBA, FBA Empress, happy belated birthday to you. And shout out to my beautiful goddess sister. Nikki the God in the house and shout out to some of the other brothers and sisters in the room as well. Thank you for this space and um, we are grateful and a lot is learned um, and a lot is discussed and a lot of knowledge is revealed that we need. It is necessary to gatekeep and I thank you and I lay my, my plane. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, any words? Uh, what's up, Nikki? Down there at Happy! I know he's a birthday. FBA first. Happy birthday to you. Um, what day was your boy? I, he can't speak now, but I'm trying to figure. Y'all know me. I'm also. I don't talk about my car reading too much on Twitter. But when, when the minute I find somebody's birthday, I be like, "What car are you?" <laughs> but, um, but I uh, so yeah, I appreciate you, Miriam. Yeah, we just this documentary. I'm not playing. We just going in, into deep water, and we are gonna find out who can swim. Let the truth, let 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 the depth of the water prove who's true. And that's the whole point of my documentary series that we do. Let's just go into deep water and let's see who can swim. And then from there, you guys can decide who's telling the truth. Uh, Shanky, you've been waiting for a long time. Uh, go ahead. Hey, hey, everybody, to the room. I came in the room late, but um, um. Did you guys mention New Orleans? It's been the Burt right? Um, uh, it's you know it's been the um, the city that Burt Jazz. Yeah, when, uh, early when the when the room first started. I didn't hear you guys. So when the room first started, I I used New York as an example, but I talked about New Orleans jazz and how although New Orleans jazz started in New Orleans, it took off. It took on a life of its own everywhere it went. Kansas City okay. had its own style. Versus the Carolina style of jazz, versus the New York mm -hmm. style of jazz, versus. But even though it started in New York, and one thing I no, it started, I started in New off, Orleans. I'm not in New Orleans. I was, one thing, one thing I, I pointed out as it started in New Orleans. One thing I appreciate about people from New Orleans is they'll one make sure to properly lay claim to starting jazz, but at the same time, be open enough to allow other other segments of the country's jazz to flourish without having. Way a lot of New York, too many New Yorkers do when it comes to hip hop, you know. And so I appreciate that from people from New Orleans, yeah. They'll acknowledge it, but at the same time, give space for all of the other forms of jazz and treat it with the same kind of love, um, as it as their own. So, uh, but go ahead. Okay, yeah, that's it. That's all I wanted to say because I didn't hear, but I know I came in late. You know what I'm saying? So much respect, much respect. Yeah, much respect. That's all I want to say. And actually, I had that conversation with a few months ago, a couple months ago with Tank from Tank and the Bangers. I love Tank and the Bangers out of New York. 
And thanks. She's such a beautiful soul. Like her soul is beautiful when you speak to her. Um, I had that conversation with her about how I appreciate New Orleans for keeping music alive. Um, for they don't do too much. Like they gatekeep it through your play. They don't talk a lot. They just keep producing and to this day. They're still producing greatness. Christian Scott on the trumpet, Tank in the Bangers. It's like every time you look up, New Orleans is, just keep putting it out. They ain't got to run their mouth too much. They just keep showing Trombone it. Shorty. Trombone Shorty. Oh, I'm glad you brought him up. Chat room. People in the listen. Let me tell y'all something. If you want to see a show, if you want to see a show, you better go see Trombone Shorty. Now, Trombone Shorty, now, he's somebody who, if when it comes to buying his music, I can't listen to his music too much on the radio. Uh, if you can, that's cool. He's not my cup of tea too much to listen to in the car. But when he comes to L.A., I spend money on seeing him 100% of the time he comes to L.A. If he comes to L.A. twice in the year, I'm about to see that nigga two times. Do y'all like uh do like, you like second line music? Because no, that's where he come out of. I don't like second line music. That's the thing. Yeah, that's second line music. Yeah. That's why you probably can't listen to it. But he uh, come, second he, he, line come, music. he come out of second line and it is the jazz. I, I wanna jazz. make something very clear about second line. Second line music is the genesis of what we do. I love it. I appreciate it. I appreciate it for what it is. But we gotta get to a point, black folks, where we can not like something but still appreciate it. Me personally. I don't like second line music. I don't like listening to it. If I hear some second line, second line music, I'm, and now when I go to New Orleans, but it's big now, though, yeah, because you don't like I, it. When I go to New Orleans, big. hold on, hold on. That's the whole point I'm making. When I go to New Orleans, I appreciate it. I, I, I haven't been to New Orleans in a while, but I've been a lot. Um, I appreciate it for what it is, but I know how big it is. I know how great it is. I know how much second line music means to music in general. I know a lot of the music that I listen to now comes out of the second line. But can I listen to second line music? The answer is no. I don't like it. And I'm not a big fan of trombone. But we kept I'm not it. A, and I'm that's the big... big thing about it. We kept it and it's a history that still walks the street. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm talking, I'm don't interrupt. It's a history. Don't interrupt me. I don't mind. I'll let you speak, but don't interrupt me. It's all right. Don't interrupt me. Um, I know, but just don't keep on highlighting that you don't like. It. And so, okay, yeah, you've had you've had enough time to speak. Again, I can. You ain't gonna tell me what not to express my preferences. I will express my preferences, and either you're gonna be mature enough to accept it or not. But my preferences are my preferences. And Zydeco music, I know it's different than second line music. But I don't like neither one. If I hear some second line music, come on XM Radio next. I'm not listening to that shit. I'm, if somebody has a fucking washboard and a spoon, I'm not listening to that shit. I don't like it. But at the same time, I respect it. Because a lot of our music evolved from it. And if you ask my opinion, thank God, it evolved from it. Because if it was still that shit, I wouldn't listen to it. Same thing with New York hip hop. A lot of that early stuff outside of Houdini, I never liked Run DMC. I don't like Run DMC. Sorry. I don't like none of that New York shit outside of Houdini early on. I thank God that shit evolved. Because if it stayed the sound, if New York, if rap stayed how it sounded, other than Houdini, if it stayed how it sounded in 1983, I wouldn't be listening to that shit. It evolved. Same thing, I appreciate the blues. But the blues that I listen to starts really with chess records in the 50s. That sound, B.B. King in the 60s. That's the era of blues that I like. I don't like Robert Johnson blues. It all comes out of Robert Johnson, P.D. Weestraw. But that era of the blues, that Mississippi Delta blues, I don't like it. I ain't going to listen to it. I'm not going to fake in front and be like, just because I appreciate the blues, just because I understand what the 12-bar blues did and how everything is built off of it, 
I'm not going to sit here and act like I listen to it. I don't like it. It's not my cup of tea. Now, what it evolved into, when you're dealing with that Muddy Waters mid-50s chess record sound, I love that. That early 60s, mid-60s B.B. King, don't nobody love me but my mama, but she, and she could be jiving too. I'm listening to that all day. But am I going to listen to Pity We Straw? No, I'm not. I don't like go-go music. I appreciate go-go music because D.C., that was one of the areas where black people were allowed to keep drums, cowbells, and so that sound is dominant in go-go music. But me personally, I'm not a big fan of the cowbell. I don't mind the cowbell on a one and a two. I mean, on, on, as, as a quarter note to sort of keep the rhythm going. I don't mind playing the cowbell on the quarter note or the half note, but all that... I don't like that DC shit. Uh, next. I'm not listening to it. And I stand on it. Because black people are so great, we can create sounds that a lot of people like that I don't like. Just like you may be certain sounds that I like that somebody else may not like. A lot of people from the Midwest don't get sugar free. And the East Coast, some people do. But in my experience, people not from LA, for the most part, don't understand sugar free. And I get it. You ain't got to like sugar free. But I do. Why you bullshit? That's how fucking great we are. We can have sounds that we love, sounds that we're neutral on, don't really care either way, and sounds that we hate. It's still our family. Just like we got cousins we like, we got cousins we don't like. We got co-workers. That's just life. I ain't about to sit here and say I should appreciate some shit. No, I don't like fucking second line music. I hate it. And when I'm in New Orleans and I'm drunk, that's the only time I can listen to it. After my, after I drink a 64 ounce hurricane, when I go to New Orleans, I get them big ass Miller Lite bottles and 64 ounce bottles that they serve beer in. And I say, nah, fuck that beer. Put a hurricane in that bitch. When I'm about 75% through my 64 ounce hurricane, now I can listen to some seven, some to some second line music and not want to punch somebody. But if I'm not that loaded and I hear second line music, I'm probably gonna want to punch somebody in the nose. I don't like that shit. But I will say, if Trombone Shorty's in town, y'all better go see his concert. I'm not a big fan of the sound, but that brother puts on a show. I'll never forget, in my 25 years going to the Hollywood Bowl, the worst show ever was like in 2010. This is when I discovered Trombone Story. In 2011, then I'm going to get to the next speaker. 2011, 2012. Usually the Hollywood Bowl never has bad shows. Every show is good. You don't have to know the artists, but if they're at the Hollywood Bowl, it's going to be a good fucking show. Well, this was me and my wife. We looked at each other and we agreed. This was the worst fucking show ever we've been to at the Hollywood Bowl. Them first two acts sucked monkey balls. They wasn't shit. And then this cat named Trump Bone Shorty came on stage. I didn't know who he was. Man, that motherfucker took a corpse of an audience and flipped that hole into life. And he went to work. And after that night, when he flipped the worst show ever I had, I had ever been to into a good show, I became a lifelong permanent fan. So the trombone stories in town, even if you like me and you don't like second line music, because I can't stand second line music, and yes, I said it, and I'm proud of it, and I'll never like it. But go to a trombone story concert if you can. Um, Next up, Miss G, you the co-host. You know, you get to run things around this motherfucker. You said you got to say that we're going to get to Minnesota. Uh, Miss G probably ain't there. She probably 
watching yeah. watching Arsenio Hall reruns. Um, Minnesota, it's on you. Yeah, I just want to say, uh, Duane, uh, I applaud you for getting the historical context in order when it comes to our music and stuff like that. You know, and we really supposed to be celebrating the um, hip hop right now. Other people, they ain't got nothing to celebrate. So <laughs> that's, why we, that's why we getting attacked, dog. Because for real, for real, for real, we supposed to be celebrating uh, hip hop. And I just wanted to bring up a point that um, one of the most, one of the guys who actually commercialized this thing and took it to the took it to the next level, man. They just ignoring him right now, and that's Hammer. And, and I don't know how people feel about him when it comes to hip hop, but when it comes to commercialization of this, that guy took it to the next level. And it's like he was on the Beyonce level, and he ain't getting no recognition, no sit downs, no no nothing. And I'm like, whoa, that's that's kind of crazy to me. And that's all I wanted to drop and say. Hey, excuse me. This blunt just hit got a little better. I thought it was shit. Ooh, fuck. But anyway, I tweeted that about a week ago. And MC Hammer retweeted me. And then he took down my retweet because I, I put some cussing in it and just reposted what I said. Um, minus the other shit that I put in there. I was saying, Hammer, get your money. Get your money. Get your money, Hammer. I get it. You know, but at the end of the day, um, that's right. You cannot adequately celebrate hip hop without one celebrating Arsenio Hall and the Arsenio Hall show and the Arsenio Hall show being the first platform to give hip hop prominence. Johnny Carson wasn't bringing you on hip hop acts. Neither was David Letterman. Neither was Jay Leno. None of those guys were bringing you on hip hop. It was Arsenio Hall and hip hop I don't know about y'all, if you feel me or not, but in my opinion, hip hop was waiting up to eleven o'clock. Matter of fact, to eleven forty-five because the music didn't come on till like way later. To see MC Hammer walk out onto that stage with two thousand dancers, and that's hip hop. You hear all these niggas talking about is Chris Brown the next Michael Jackson? Hold. On. Is Chris Brown MC Hammer? Let's start there. Let's start there before we bring up the great MJ. Is he MC Hammer? MC Hammer, you can say what you want about his music. Yeah, he had a lot of fluff lyrics, yada, yada, yada. But when that man walked on stage, the world stopped what it was doing. If you want to celebrate Hip Hop 50, I want to see MC Hammer do a Super Bowl halftime show. I guarantee goddamn you that'd be the greatest Super Bowl halftime show since Prince and Michael Jackson. Say what you want about his music. That motherfucker put hip hop in front of your motherfucking face because you could not watch this nigga with a duck tail and baggy ass pants back in the days when pants was tight as fuck. <clears throat> That's another thing I thank Cameron for, for bringing in loose-fitting pants. Goddamn. Niggas used to catch yeast infection with them little-ass jeans we wore in the 80s. Nigga, I, I'm so glad he brought that in. Man, imagine niggas in your nutsitch, on the back of your nutsitch, in some tight-ass jeans. That's a miserable feeling. So you be over here squinting your legs together, looking like a woman trying to put on some sexy jeans. Like, nah, I ain't trying to put on no sexy jeans. I'm scratching my nuts with my thighs, nigga. Thank God for MC Hammer. Because he brought in pants baggy enough to where a nigga could scratch his nuts without looking like a sissy. He did. And so, that's MC Hammer. How the fuck? How in the T-H-E-E-F-U-C-K fuck? Can we celebrate hip hop without one celebrating MC Hammer? Because Mr. Zell brought up a good point. True hip hop has always been underground. True hip hop, I don't give a fuck about no record sales. Back in the day, MC Hammer took a lot of bullets for going number one. MC Hammer 
getting a KFC commercial was not celebrated. That was frowned upon. That was looked down upon. Like MC Hammer, all that success he had, he that guy heat. And the only reason why I didn't get more heat was because MC Hammer was a gangster and niggas knew whatever they had to say. He was going to see them. But imagine if MC Hammer was as soft as his music. Then he would have really got some heat. The only reason why he, I said, the only reason why he didn't get more because MC Hammer would come see your ass if you had something to say with 40 other niggas. And didn't nobody want that smoke. But MC Hammer, if you look at today's rap, what do people celebrate about Jay-Z? Look how many records he sold. What do they say about Drake? He had 13 number ones. What do they say about all the number one guys since 2000? The reason everyone put movies, they want to put somebody in their top five, Eminem, it's all about record sales. Well, the man that kicked the roof off that record sale thing was MC motherfucking Hammer. So if you're going to be celebrating record sales and who sold the most, how the fuck can you celebrate hip hop without celebrating MC Hammer first? If, if record sales is what it is now. Which one is it? Is it the old school way of the streets putting it out there or is it record sales? Well, based on the media, hip hop media since 2000, since Jay-Z took over to the top of hip hop and his corny ass, it's been all about record sales. So if it's all about record sales, why is him C. Hammer not celebrated first? Um, I know I have... Brother Devon um, B, you want to make me your um other co-host so I can help you out on stage and get yeah, yeah, some garbage. Thank you. I'll do that. I'll do that. Yeah. Um, I just sent to you. Next up, we have a uh, Davy. Yo, what's going on, Devon B? Hey, man. God damn, bro. I've been in shit. I'm of course I'm born and raised in the South. I've been in music. Um, as far as like band, trumpet, French horn, baritone, violin, and shit like that, He's, since um since I was in the fifth grade, like um, but bro, like the the span of knowledge that you have when it comes down to this music shit, fam, bro, you was selected to be doing this um documentary and everything you got going on, bro. I can't wait to support it and wait till that shit come out. Man, because, man, you took Arsenio Hall from me, man. I was going to come up here and say something about Arsenio Hall. Y'all done dropped that. I'm like, damn, bro, I ain't going to come up here and look stupid. Um, But I definitely wanted to be like, yo, shots out to you, bro. I can't wait to see the – um, I can't wait to see the documentary and everything, nigga. I need books from you. I need children's books. I need comics. I need all that, you know what I'm saying, for your progression for the future. The, um, Two things I came up here to say is I heard some people saying, like – um that hip hop is a New York thing. It's not a black American thing. I want to know what you would say back to that. And then I also want to know, cause I'll be on your car readings and stuff like that. Um, Lioness crown put me on. Um, I want to know, uh, or did Nikki put me on? Nah, I saw a thumbs down, but I, anyway, you know what I'm saying? I want to know what did, what, what did it say in your cards when it came down to um when it came down to your your place in this universe when it comes down to us gatekeeping our culture for the music? And that was it, fam, and I appreciate it, fam. Uh double question. I mean answer your first question because that's when I remember that I'm gonna ask you what the other question was. When it comes to the cards, um the cards is what is what gave me confirmation to do this documentary. I, if I'm gonna give you the all honest truth. It was two things that made me do this documentary. I'm, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm a weird-ass nigga. I'm not no straight-laced-ass nigga. Like, a lot of these dudes talk about they don't smoke and drink, and they, they I, I, I smoke and I drink. I'm, I'm on a bottle of wine right now in my third blood. Um, it was a mushroom trip that got me to do my Black American Music Family Tree, and it was a mushroom trip that told me to do the documentary. Um, that's what it was. Um, I was listening to music one night, I I heard that that Pete that 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 tweet that you guys see up there with Pete Rock. I saw that tweet. That was two years ago, and then um, then uh, I, that that bothered me, and I sat on it and I was trying to figure out well, okay what I got I got to do something. And I'm gonna tell you right now my a quick timeline. I when I when that tweet was put up that you guys see in the jumbotron by with Pete Rock in 2021, at that point in my life I thought. 
what I know musically, I thought everybody knew. I didn't. I'm I'm being God's honest truth. I thought everything I'm talking about right now, I thought was common knowledge. I just I just I've just always just loved music and I just I've always just studied it from going back to when I was sitting on my father's lap watching Motown documentaries in nineteen eighty five. So but I thought everybody did that. I, I didn't know. So when 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 I responded to Pete Rock's tweet and, and I saw how I didn't know the truth, I was like, whoa, that shit kind of threw me off. And so I was kind of spinning in my head, okay, I got to do something about it, but what do I do? And then a couple months later, Fat Joe and Buster Ryan started running their goddamn mouths and saying a whole bunch of dumb shit. And I had saw some shit that the niggas had said, and then I uh, did a mushroom trip. I was on I was on some shrooms, like a muscle. I probably took like seven grams of shrooms. And and I was blasted, blasted off listening to music. And probably had about fifteen blunts that night. And it hit me in the middle of my trip. I saw a vision of a music tree. I saw a vision. And that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put my music, our music, in a tree. And I went to sleep, and I woke up the next day, and I sat on my computer for 12 hours, and I completed about 90 percent of that Black American music tree just off memory, just off top of my head. Uh, I completed 90 percent of that Black American music tree, fresh off of a mushroom trip. Very vivid dream I had on that trip, and I went in. And I did 90% of that tree. And then from there, I spent about six months refining the tree. Um, I bought a whole bunch of books. I probably spent, at the time, I probably spent about $4,000 on books. Because one, one, book, one book alone cost me like $1,800 because it was out of print. Um, That's why, like me, look, I ain't going to sit there and be like, no, no I, I found my, my, this idea came out of a fucking mushroom trip. If you're looking for a nigga that don't smoke or drink, then I ain't the one. Um, and so, but it was so clear in that trip, I had to do this. And so uh, I did 90% of that tree on memory. And then I spent another six months just researching myself, making sure I was right, going back and buying old college textbooks that I had in college. Because when I was in college, I studied, I studied a lot of music in college. And um, I, sometimes I bought books, sometimes I didn't. I would, how I graduated college, I, I used to memorize lectures. Like God gave me a really good memory. When I hear something, I don't forget it. Reading comprehension, I, I probably got to read it three times, um, unless I speed read. I could speed read, and remember it the first time, but it was that. It was a mushroom trip. And then I spent six months refining my tree, making sure I was right, uh, watching documentaries, buying books. Uh, unreleased, like uh, peer-reviewed journals. Some stuff not even in books. I was going to different colleges: Stanford University, Harvard University, um, Howard. Reading peer-reviewed journals on music because uh, once I put it out, I wanted to make sure I was right and exact. I let the mushroom trip inspire me, but in inspired me. But you better be for damn sure when it came to my research. I was just high on weed. <laughs> anyway. Um, that's what, that's how that came. And then you niggas was like, you need to do a documentary. I'm like, I ain't doing no goddamn documentary. I ain't got time for that shit. I ain't got time for that. I'm going to do my little fucking documentary. I promise you a little documentary. But you niggas kept it like, you need to do a documentary. I'd be like, nigga, I ain't doing all that shit. You know, I, I, I can't do enough documentary. Watch his shit. You know, I ain't doing that. I don't, I, I don't even want to be. Let me tell you the guy's honest truth. I don't even want to be in this lane doing documentaries. I really don't. I don't give a fuck about this shit. But from my years working with kids, I I gotta the baby's gotta know how great we are. And I did a lot of work one on one with kids, but I figured I could be much more um much more effective in larger groups than just one on one. So between y'all like telling me I gotta do this shit. And then uh, going back to what you said about the cards, um, I read my cards and I'm a king of clubs. Uh, king of clubs is a master teacher. We're born, every king of clubs is born to teach. 
and we're born to teach whatever it is that's on our spirit to teach. Malcolm X was the king of clubs. So if you're if you're born under that card, that's one of the cards that's it appears in every month. One of the few cards that appears in every month. There's a king of clubs born every month. Whatever your passion is, if your if your birth card is a king of clubs or queen of clubs, ten of clubs, those are cards that whatever your passion is, you're supposed to teach. And so when I read that in my cards, that's the way be like, all right, fuck it, I'll do it. I did this shit regretfully. I ain't I ain't want to do this shit. If you look at my documentary, like I told you before, I did that shit. I filmed that shit 15 months ago and 45 pounds ago. I'm way fatter than that thing. I look at that shit now like, God damn. I look like a, I look like a stack of cinnamon rolls in that documentary. You know how much, I, how many times I've seen that shit and was like, you know what? Man, I know I ain't all the way in shape yet, but let me go ahead and refilm. I'm like a black ass snowman in this bitch. You know what I mean? I, don't, I gave myself a year of excuses for not putting this shit out. Cause I really don't want to be in the space. I'd rather be cracking jokes on stage. Um, I'd rather be just talking music on Facebook and Twitter just because I love it. The reason why I'm not a full-time musician is because I love music so much. I loved it too much to become a full-time drummer. So I just played the drums at church and with whoever I knew personally, I never jumped in, put my hat in the race to become a studio musician. Cause I love music too much. This shit is way too close to me. So I really don't want to be here. But the cards told me that's where I got to go. So, and one thing I know, I know about cards is behind every great challenge, if, if, that's just one thing about life. Your greatest rewards in life are behind your greatest challenges. And this is a, a challenge. I don't want to do this shit. I really don't. But I've been called to, and I can't deny it. So that's where I'm at with it. Appreciate that, fam. And then I think my uh, damn, bro, that was hey, man. Shouts out to you, my G. That damn, bro, that was shit. I don't know for me being a for me being such a long time musician, bro, and just hearing the knowledge that you have, that shit is like my. I won't say it's mind boggling to me, but you literally got more knowledge than damn near combined all the motherfuckers I know that's in music, bro. That shit's something special, man. It's a it's a gift you have. So you just like you said, you was called for it. And I'm I'm glad you answered the phone, my G. You know what I'm saying? Um, the uh to the other question, um. Man, I think man, this nigga might have been a tether. I don't really, I ain't really put too much weight to what the nigga was talking about. I was in a space the other day, and the nigga was like, "Oh, I, she was talking shit about people from the south, talking about, oh yeah, man, y'all niggas claiming hip hop, hip hop just a New York thing, this, this, and that." You know what I'm saying? People was cooking back at him. You know what I'm saying? Talking about the roots, um, how our music evolved and stuff like that. But how would you respond um, to one of these fuck? We can curse. Yeah, how we respond to one of these fuck ass, hater ass, half tether ass niggas um, saying shit like that? What I say in response to them is this, and that's one. It's one thing that I'm covering in my documentary. The overall, the the overall art of my documentary series is is bigger than hip hop. The Black American music family tree. This is a family thing, and. One thing that I set my, my intentions in my documentary is to prove to, with you guys using three to five points of reference how every genre of music that we create comes with its own ling linguistic, ling lingua franca. That's the actual word to use anthropologically. It comes with its own lingua franca. It comes with its own style of dress. It comes with its own style of music. It comes with this, usually a style of graffiti, calligraphy. In hip hop, it happened to be uh, tagging. In bebop, it was Art Deco. Art Deco was the, callig was the calligraphy of bebop. Um, and so uh, my, my attempt is to show the world that this is black American culture because music is a sonic interpretation of your environment. And in New York, it's going to come out and look this way because of the environment of New York. And New York has different environments within that. So a Queens project is going to sound different than a Harlem project. Or it's going to sound different than a project 
out of the uh, out, out of Long Island, because even with that, you have micro environments, you have macro environments, and then in L.A., it's gonna take on a different twist. Inglewood hip hop is a little bit different than Compton. But I'm not gonna go that deep yet. I will at some point in, in future seasons, but in this first season, we're going to show how it manifests culturally in different places. And the reason why it manifests culturally in Detroit, Chicago, Oakland, any different places, be, and, and it doesn't manifest in Kingston, it doesn't manifest in Puerto Rico, it's because it's a black cultural thing. That's why every city that black people live in, it has its own version of the culture, while no city outside of America has its own genuine culture before the last hip hop culture before the last, what, 20 years? And if anybody had a hip-hop culture outside of the United States, it's been the fucking Japanese and the Koreans. Go look them up. And their culture is a direct derivative art. They was wearing K-Swiss and Kangos and big chains in the 90s. The, the Koreans and the Japanese hopped on what we was doing in hip-hop before the Jamaicans and Puerto Ricans. That's a fact. But even else, but they'll at least be at least they're understanding enough to say, "Hey, this is what black people are doing." So that's how we do that. That's how we're gonna approach that. And in my documentary series, I'm gonna prove it. And when I say prove it, that my minor in college was cultural anthropology. If I tell you something, I have to give you three to five points of reference. I have to, or I'm telling you some bullshit. So that's where we at with it. That's why it's important that you attend the live stream pay-per-view event because that's going to fund the season. I did this first um, doc, this first one on my own dime to show you where I'm coming from. But in the series, man, I told you I got some legendary artists. I got some, some producers. I got some actors. I got music historians. I got uh, PhD professors. And we attacking this shit on all angles. And I got my father in this motherfucker. So we can give you what was going on on the streets in the 70s. I got my dad in this bitch. I got some more people that 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 were around in different eras. So we could talk about what was going on in black America on the streets to prove to the world that this is a black American culture, not just some phenomenon that started in 1973 on Cedric Avenue. And that bullshit ass story. Um... But Alistair is next. And then I'm I'm going to give everyone, after Alistair, I'm going to give everybody the last chance and I'm going to uh, speak. And then I'm going to close it out. Uh, Alistair, it's on you. Hey, what's going on? How you doing, brother? I just want to say um, I'm so glad that you do, you and that you're doing this, um, this documentary, you and brother Tariq, because I think we need to go at the root of, of the creation of hip hop here in the United States. I also want to go back to what you were talking about, MC Hammer. And at one point, a lot of people tend to forget that he was on par with Michael Jackson with his Too Legit tour, which I went to his concerts and they were all, I mean, it was sold out. People were really asking you. I'm not not even. And it's not even to even go at because people want to talk about Beyonce and Michael Jackson. Chris, in 1990, before we remember the time, remember the time hit and kind of blew the shit. It yeah, was corrected course. But right. before we remember the time hit, that was the people was like really hey, this nigga hammers too. People looking at him like ooh, Mike might got a problem. We was yeah, that. exactly. Yes, yes, he. He had a world tour and everything else, and he was just as, was up there with Michael Jackson. And sometimes his concerts were doing better than all the other British um act um performers like Queen, Elton John, David Bowie. I mean, it, can you imagine if Hammer would would able to perform at the Super Bowl at that time? I mean, his his. It would have been one of the greatest performances in Super Bowl history, halftime history, bar none. He was on par with Michael Jackson at that time. And it's just a shame that 
because he was getting big, he was on Taco Bell, he was promoting um, British Nights, which I remember as a child, as a, as, as a high school student, I was buying his shoes, British Nights and everything else. Those were some cool shoes back then, too. I mean, he was on top of the world. It was a shame that, unfortunately, Tribe Called Quest, um, I think it was um, either Q-Tip, kind of dissed him, and um, Ice Cube, it, it was just wrong what they did. They, they do, they, too they, short. Right. Too, yeah, too short. I don't know why Too Short was doing that to um to his fellow um Oakland native man like that. Cause man, I enjoy watching some some of um MC Hammer's um concert and everything else. <laughs> I mean, white <laughs> folks would get white I'm, folks. I'm gonna, you, were, white I'm folks gonna let you get your point off, but to your point, yeah. I was a young boy. I was 10, 11 around that time. And I remember hearing uh, Q, because Q was my favorite, and hearing him say lines like on death certificate. You ready to see me? You ready to see a nigga with 15 niggas on stage out trying to outdance each other? We all knew he was talking about Hammer. Yeah. You know, um, too short. And I love these niggas. And I remember, because I was a young, impressionable kid, I remember at the time, that changed my perception of Hammer. That made me start like not liking him. And so by the time Hammer came out with pumps and the bumps and he's on death row, we was like, man, get this nigga out of here. We, that was like, I remember as a child, the way other rappers went at Hammer, that did alter my perception of Hammer at the time. Yes. Now, if I was in my 20s at the time, I would have seen past it. But at the time, I was 10, 11, 12. So I was listening to them niggas. And I was like, yeah, that shit is corny. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, it's just a shame they kind of tore that man down because he got he was getting things rolling. He was on par with Michael Jackson at that time. They should have just just let Hammer do his own thing and everything else. Because if he would have, if, if they would have just let Hammer alone, brother, I think he would have took over the '90s hip hop era and turned it to another um, stratosphere and everything else. I'm going to land my plane there. Yes, sir. Yeah, it was a combination of that. And then remember the record. We always go back go back to the white supremacists. The industry stopped putting money behind rappers that weren't talking about bullshit. By the time the mid-90s came, rappers had to talk about nonsense in order to get funded. And that that's what got promoted. And shouts out to Suge Knight for bringing Hammer on, on over to death row. But at the same time, we we all had our attention on all eyes on me at the time. And that's just what it was. And so that drowned out what it, what Hammer did over there at Death Row. Um the industry moved on. No more digital underground, no more X Clan, no more arrested development, and those groups that gave us that good, positive, strong messaging. And the artists who did survive, like Too Short, Too Short would yeah, he talked about bitches, but he also had positive music too. But by the time you get to the late nineties, no more too short positive music, all of his bitches. So we always got to go back to who uh, made those decisions and put money behind those different acts. Um, but yeah, we're we going to we close it out. So everybody that, that's going to go next, uh, keep your comments brief. And then we're going to close it out. Cali Love, I'm going to get to you. you. You knew it's in. But the Woolly Dynamite has his hand up. Then I'm going to go to Minnesota. And then Cali Love. And then I'm going to let my moderators finish out what they got to say last. Please keep your comments under two minutes because I'm. Yeah, I'm ready to crack up with another bo bottle of wine and listen to music and stop talking to you niggas. I got some, I got Miles Davis, Michael Jackson, and most of all, Earth and Earth, Wind and Fire waiting on me. I'm looking at this Earth and Fire Spirit album like, yes, it's time for us to have some uh, some talk. It's about time for me to talk to Stevie Wonder and songs in the kid life. So you niggas got like 10 or 15 more minutes of my time. <laughs> no disrespect. But go ahead, Eraser. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I just want to appreciate you for having the space, real quick, brother. And I'm um, actually the one. I actually got a treat for you, brother. Um, I'm gonna be headed to my grandfather um crib this weekend because I gotta go pick up some mail. My grandmother getting on me about my mail being over there, so I gotta run over there real quick. And I'm I'm gonna hit the basement up, and he got all of those twelve inch jazz funk blues. Uh, do wop records. I mean, he got tapes, all of that, and I'm gonna sit there. I'm gonna take a video, of all of that, send it to you on, on the back channel, so you can take a look at that and tell me what you think. Um, uh, I think it was Davy. 
<clears throat> that was um making a point about uh um did you ask the question you were saying that uh, you know people who were saying that you know uh hip hop is a New York thing um I, I, I'm from New York brother born and raised my family um uh, and I'm FBA on all sides of my family all sides nobody in my family is is of any uh, any other ethnicity and um my family's been up here since the 1940s in in this city um and just to tell you I just want you so you can have a little background on me real quick but to make my point is that um People who say that are often, often tethers. That's a tether argument. People will say, well, listen, new hip-hop is a New York City culture, and they deliberately say that to detach the rest of the family from, from our culture. So, no, you know, because the whole thing about it is that even though, um, and it brings bring us back to the point of us not having instruments, when we didn't have instruments, and then hey, all we had... Every we have, bro, yeah, I you have, give- I want to give you credit for that too, just because you kind of went on past it, but I want to emphasize the point you just made. I got to personally give you credit for pointing, for highlighting to me that that's been more of an immigrant thing than a New York nigga thing. And it made me, because f- I'm from the West, all we heard was uh, shit talking and hate from New Yorkers. You know what I mean? So for us, our perception is them niggas is haters. And, but when you brought up the fact that it's an immigrant thing that made me sit back and take stock. Like, who be the one saying this the most? And seven times out of ten, eight times out of ten, hell, most of them nine times out of ten, now that they're coming out the closet, they they are immigrants. We didn't say those niggas was immigrants uh, <laughs> until recently. But go ahead. Yeah, that that is an immigrant point. And then you and and also in New York, if you understand the dynamic, you also have a, a you know half FBAs. I'll give you an example, like Nori. So this is why he he'll straddle the fence and perpetuate one thing one minute and then you know he plays this oh yo I don't know stuff you know he knows you know what I'm saying Fat Joe knows these these people know who who this culture belongs to so let's just be especially Fat Joe so he's lying you know he knows he's lying and um and and then yeah that's there so but just to get back to my point that's a point that they make to detach themselves detach the rest of the family from the culture to keep up that argument. But if he, but which Dewan is going to get into when he does his uh, docu series, but you gonna also understand that us not having instruments, all we had was our um our, our our parents and grandparents blues records, funk records, gospel records, and all of that is Black American music and culture, which is the foundation of hip hop. Hip hop is, is 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 a child of the funk, which also brings me to another point. Even when you listen to all of the hip hop artists from the very beginning, they always talk, or they always give reference to the funk. They gotta be funky. Uh, Easy E, yo, 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 yo! I got something from the DOC, man. Listen, it got to be funky, and, that, and that's all from the East Coast to the West Coast. We so so when you understand that 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 point alone, you can't take it away from us. So just uh, so that's something I just wanted to bring up. And yeah, Dewan, I, I'm I'm definitely going to send you that video this weekend, brother. And I want you to see all those records, and all of them are 12 inch vinyl, brother. Original 12 inch and four or five. So. I, I, I'm gonna send that video to you, and I got you, bro. Yes, sir, brother. I appreciate you, man. And um, man, when I was in Jersey last week, and I saw that New York City City skyline, man, that shit got me antsy. Like, okay, I gotta come back out here and go to New York, spend some time in New York. Cause I was in Philly, and we went, we went way up to Jersey to uh, what's that prison city in Jersey? Uh, what's it? Rawway? Rawway? Yeah, Rawway. Yeah, that's Rawway. Yeah. I mean, if you was in Rawway, you wasn't. You was right there. <laughs> yeah, when we got off the freeway, I saw that New York City skyline and my heart just dropped. Like, ah, I want to get there. But, you know, we was right there in Rowway and we, we drove there from Philly for rehearsal. Uh, and, man, that girl turned out. It's, oh, my God. She was saying her motherfucking ass. The shit, she, the note she was in in rehearsal. My God. Um, but, man, it just, no, New York. And, and but you know I'm glad you you clarified that. But one thing I'm really pointing on my documentary is like right down the road, Philadelphia. Philadelphia's imprint on black music is so undertold. I wish I would prefer a Philly nigga do a documentary on Philadelphia. But if they're not, because I prefer I'm an LA nigga. I'm about to come up with a whole bunch of shit on LA. Cause we don't get talked about enough, partially because we live in the dopest goddamn city in the earth. We don't feel the need to brag. You dig what I'm saying? Why, why, why are you gonna brag when you gonna walk down the goddamn street 
you know, all that sunshine and shit. Fuck, fuck the rest of that shit. The moon don't bark at the dog. But it's still so many innovations that got created here and got done here that I want to give credit to. But at the same time, I want to give credit to Detroit, to Memphis, to Chicago, to Philadelphia, to Atlanta, Dallas, Detroit, uh, Dayton, Ohio, especially Dayton, Ohio. East but, St. Louis. East St. Louis, Miles Davis, yes. I, Memphis. But I would definitely, I, I think I already said Memphis. Um, but yeah, if I didn't say Memphis, yeah, definitely Memphis. I, but I would prefer my preference, D.C. My preference would be that people from those cities do it. Buffalo, New York. Buffalo has a dope ass story to tell. My preference would be that there become a whole cauldron of documentary makers and people will start with their city. And because where, wherever Seattle, wherever black people live in, in large numbers, we create dope fucking music and that all the stories need to be told. But I'm telling you Philly niggas right now, if one of you good hairline, good haircut, having ass niggas, don't do the fucking documentary. I will. I promise you that. Same thing with Dayton, Ohio, Cleveland. If you niggas don't get on board, I'm coming. But I would much rather you, I'm putting it out there because I'd rather you do it. It make my life a lot easier. I can focus on other shit. I'm a Gemini. I like doing different shit. I like reading cards one minute, talking to you niggas one minute. And y'all see, I didn't put much, I didn't put that many tweets out the last few days because I didn't feel like talking to none of you niggas the last five days. So I, I, I put the bare minimum of tweets out and posts out because I was just on some Gemini. I want to mind my own fucking business kind of shit. And so that's just who I am. So I much rather I much I rush rather you local niggas do these documentaries. But if one of you Philly niggas don't do it, I'm talking about you niggas. Cause y'all did some dope ass, great ass shit. And you niggas is too humble and quiet about it. Y'all just like LA niggas with Philadelphia. Y'all don't brag enough about what you done did. And you did a lot. And that story has to be told. I love every any if, if you black American, I fucking love you. I'm gonna talk shit about you because I why not? You know, it's fun. Like, you niggas from, from Fort Worth, I'm always going to talk about you niggas. Gold Tooth, Jerry Crow, having ass niggas. Can't even pronounce seven rights. Niggas say seven, nigga. What the fuck? Ain't no M in seven. Only them Fort Worth niggas, Silm. Nigga, what the fuck did the M come from? I'm going to talk some shit. I'm going to talk shit about you Seattle niggas because you niggas like wearing cross earrings and looking like fucking weirdos. Uh, but but y'all gave us heavy metal and rock and roll. Salute to y'all. But you gothic boot wearing ass niggas, y'all funny. You know, I'm, we, we gonna talk shit. You know, I'm gonna talk shit about you Atlanta niggas because half you niggas is, <laughs> don't like half you niggas like other niggas. <laughs> my bad, my bad. No, no disrespect Atlanta, but y'all got a broke wrist problem going on right now. DC, I fucking hate go go music. <laughs> I fucking hate go go music, and I always say that DC niggas, that music is fucking corny as hell to me. Too many cowbells, and it's too fucking loud. I don't like it. And I like y'all. I like I like the blackbirds though. I like the blackbirds, but nigga, fuck go go. Yes, I'm gonna talk shit, you know. But I still love y'all. Because that's who we are as a people. We can be great and we can suck at the same time. You can suck. You can create something that I fucking hate as a black person. And I still fucking love you. I hate what you created. What you created is fucking corny to me. But I still fucking love you. And that's what I'm trying to get with it, man. It's time for all of us to talk about our greatness. And talk about it with security and pride. And love for one another. And openness for one another. That's my point of view. DeWan, can I ask you a question real quick, brother, if you don't mind? Go ahead. Um, Because you said you was in Philly, right? Yeah. And real, real quick, fun fact, my grandmother was born in Philly. And my great-grandmother actually graduated from that um high school that um Will Smith went to. I, I forgot the name of it. But I got, I got papers and all of that. So, you know, anyway. um, did, What I wanted to ask you was that, um, um, did you get a chance to go to Sister Muhammad's, bro? You got to get that fish sandwich up there on the north side if you're still there. Uh, I, I stayed around where the white folks were because I couldn't. I was just there for some music that I had to get back here because I only came back to LA for one day. Now I'm back out of town. Um, I wanted to stay longer, but that's why I say I got I to go back. 
I gotta go back because I want to get up to that side, and I want to also want to hit up a few more of the museums in Philly. Philly got some dope ass museums. I love going to museums and learning shit. I learned some shit in the Philadelphia Museum, in the in, in the in the museum for the Revolutionary War, that I'm about to put in my documentary. I'm not about to put this shit on Twitter, but I learned some shit that just added so much more depth to my documentary. I'm so glad I went to Philadelphia and went to that museum. I just got a piece of information that wasn't in none of my books that I read. But I got it now, nigga. I got it now. I'm on the I be grinding for you, nigga. Nigga, I'm on the I'm on the hustle. I I I'm I'm not the kind of nigga that's content with my knowledge, nigga. I'm learning new shit every fucking day. That's who we own, bro. But I appreciate Philly for keeping that bit of information for me, man. We got to get to that point to where I, oh, I, how did I not mention Minneapolis in the Minneapolis town? Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, Prince, Mint Condition. Come on, man. Make a, somebody grab some baby powder and slap the shit out of me for not mentioning the Minneapolis town. The fuck is wrong with me? Like, we dope as fuck, like, people. Like, we gotta, like, man, stop all the fighting and embrace it. But I'm gonna get to, um, it's Cali Love, then I'm gonna get back to you, Minnesota, then, uh, man, we're gonna close it out. Okay, thank you, thank you. Good space. I thought you was gonna go to the other guy first. But, um, I'm listening, and... I heard you mention the jazz and hip hop. So the first time I ever heard jazz and hip hop mix as a collaboration happened to be with Cube. And I think he did um, John Coltrane's A Few of My Favorite Things. And I thought that was the most fantastic thing I ever heard in my life. And that was over. Now, do you remember Fifth Street Dicks? No. Okay. So that's, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go so ahead. That's where I that's heard amazing. that. Bef you know, that was way before they closed, and and they'd be over there with the spoken word and everything, and all, that whole little music, um, you know, that whole music scene. Because at Fifth Street Dicks, they play live jazz every night seven days a week and we play dominoes outside shoot this shit talk politics and consciousness it's gone now they closed it but you know that was the spot that was the spot where we heard good music good live jazz music with with actual um players and playing actual instruments saxophones and everything the drums and everything and that was my first time. And that was the bombest shit I've ever heard. And that was back in the 90s. And I haven't heard anything like that since. So I'm glad to hear that um, somebody is picking that mantle back up. Because it, it, it's some really good music. Now, I don't really do concerts. So I'm sorry. But um, I'm sure, you know, you have a, a good blend of music. But um, I don't know. Have you been listening to JD um, Behind the Bars? You know, he have a podcast on um, YouTube. And last, well, he do it every Wednesday. JD and the Lynch Mob from the Lynch Mob. He had Cube on there. And Chuck D. And Special Ed. Now, you know, I guess apparently Special Ed is trying to blame N.W.A. for the demise of hip-hop and saying that another Jamaican, another Jamaican. Okay, okay that's probably, probably it. But I guess what J.D. did was brought Special Ed on there to kind of clear the air up, you know, so, because I guess they, you know, they offended, like N.W.A. didn't start all that bullshit. You know, they didn't start violence and, you know, uh, and that's what he was trying to imply. And he was trying to it imply, was he was trying to imply that Q was really the main corporate. And it's like, what? 
But Q went on to mention that, and the same thing I heard in this space, is that after a certain period of time, well, by the mid-90s, late-90s, that conscious type of rap and hip-hop was out. The industry didn't want that. And no matter how many times he tried to reiterate that and, and um, you know, state that as a fact, special ed wasn't trying to hear it. It's like, nah, that's NWA and you and y'all know better and y'all knew better and y'all didn't have a contract and all this so extra shit. But um, I say that to say I grew up on hip hop. I, I'm a 70s child. My first album was rapper's delight and that's all we used to do you that's and then in class okay i'm from la so i want to go ahead so you know oh i want to go ahead on that point about about you i'm gonna close my, my phone battery almost dead so i'm, I'm gonna have to close this room okay. pretty soon whether i want to or not because I'm, I'm, I'm far I'm, not, I'm nowhere near a charger but um what was that hope Especially that I was talking and I saw that. I appreciate you for bringing that up. Q wrote Who's Who's the Mac? He wrote uh, Summer Vacation. He wrote Black Career and all these songs that woke the world up as to the reality that we live in and who the real enemy is, the white supremacists. So if the music was strong enough to put everybody to put a gun in everybody's hand. Well, why is it? Why wasn't it strong enough to make people consciousness conscious to see who the real enemy is? Because that was put out there too. The people like these one sided arguments, especially that wanted to talk to me. I roast that nigga. I mean, that he'd be so much. He'd be so such easy work. He'd be such easy work. I'd be like talking to a kid about what's going on. And so that's why it's important that you guys fund the doc and everything and put it out there and get it out there. Cause we need, we need people who can articulate what, what the real deal is. And oftentimes the artists can articulate. Let me tell you, I'm gonna get to you, uh, Minnesota. Let me tell you something about an artist and Miriam. She, she knows music. She knows, she understands this race. I'm pretty sure you understand this too. And Minnesota, you say you musician. I'm pretty sure you understand, you understand this. Artists, they're not the best at communicating when they're not singing. Their vehicle for communication is song, it's rapping, it's singing. When you take them out of that element of rapping or singing, most of the time they're the most horrible, they're very bad communicators. They're not, most artists, singers, people in the front, they're not the communicators. And that's okay. Because just the same way we can't sing as well as they can sing, the same way we can't rap and transmit a feeling through rap, we can transmit a, a, a feeling through interpersonal conversation. <clears throat> but most of us can't even transmit that feeling if you're speaking to a thousand people. Most people can only transmit that feeling in interpersonal small group settings. And, but you put them in front of a lot of people, they said the biggest fear is public speaking. So most people have a fear of public speaking. They can't communicate as well in front of thousands and tens of tens of thousands of people. Well, on the other hand, you got people who communicate greatly, masterfully, in front of tens of thousands, millions of people. But if you sit them down and have a question and have a conversation with them one on one, they're not the best communicators. Now, it's not to say all rappers and singers are like that, because there are some rappers and singers. Who are excellent communicators, but most aren't. They need help from those of us who don't rap and sing to communicate it for them. Because another thing about musicians and people in here in few positions who know, most people who understand music know that if you ask a musician where did this something, where did that note come from, where did that thing come from, what are they gonna tell you? I don't know. <laughs> One thing about us, FBA, that shit, that spirit, that music be coming through spirit. A lot of the dopest things we've seen with that we've done, the people who did it, they can't give you a formula. They can't tell you what it was. It just came. Because that we operate and we create our music through spirit. 
And so when it comes to our music, oftentimes, spirit supersedes our consciousness. And that's what music is. And so our artists, we put them in these conversations of where our music comes from, uh, who did what. They know what's going on. They understand what's going on. But oftentimes, they're not the best at communicating that. That's where people like me, you, and we come in. We can communicate it for them. Because I can't rap as good as Ice Cube. But I can explain music better than he can. I can't sing as good as anybody. I can't produce a record as good as Dr. Dre. You know what I mean? I'm a drummer. But I can't play the drums as, as well as some of these other guys like Chris Dave and Justin Tyson, Sonny Emery, these great drummers. Can't do that. But what I can do is explain and express the music better than they can. And that's my role. And there's a lot of us out there who, who can too. So everybody got to play their role. Just because I ain't got a top 10 record, I mean, I can't talk about this. Matter of fact, you having a top 10 record oftentimes disqualifies you from talking about it. One, because you ain't even the reason why it's a top 10 record. It's the producer and the promotion company. Anybody who's sung on that record, oftentimes songs that go top 10, that shit would have been top 10 no matter who sung on that shit. The producer made that shit top 10 and the machine behind it. Not to say that's like that with all top 10s, but it's like that with a lot of them. So just because someone went number one doesn't make them instantly qualified. Because oftentimes the person that went number one, they're the least responsible in that whole equation for going number one. And they know the least about how they got to being number one. That's just a fact. Talk to these niggas. You realize they're not as smart as you think they are. But all of us have intelligence. I'm not as smart as they are in other areas. All of our intelligent li intelligence lies in different areas. And so just like I may be able to communicate it better than they can on one level, on the other level, I can't do how they do it. Everybody's playing their own cards out. We're all playing out our own cards. And it's our job to play our cards the best we can play them. Uh, Minnesota, I know I've been running my mouth, but go ahead, Minnesota Fats, and then I'm closing out. It's all good. I just wanted to say, I remember Special Ed, he Jamaican. I even remember Heavy D, he Jamaican. None of those guys ever rapped in a Patois accent when they was doing hip-hop. Um, even Heavy D had a song with a reggae artist, just the two of us. He still was rapping in like, he was rapping like a black American. And I remember that it wasn't until a rap artist by the name of D.O.C. came out with a song called Funky Enough, rapping in a Patois accent that made it cool for them. Those guys actually was embarrassed to talk in their own accent on records. And that nigga from Dallas. <laughs> exactly. And that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, real talk. That's a good point. That's a real good point. Um, yeah, we're well, going to it first. Um, just, 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 just for all information's um, sake, bro. I'm gonna. Well, 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 I'll see Willie down the mic. Um, you want to say something real quick? Then I get. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to say that actually, K, just real quick, just for if you know, for edification, KRS was the, actually the first one to rhyme at Patois. I can't hear you, Willie down the mic. But go ahead, Miriam. Um, definitely, I agree with um what Brother Ray Sabo said. Um, heavy. I mean, um, KRS one was one of the first ones to do patois, um, even before old dude. So, and also raise a bow when I shout you out and show you love, I expect to hear it back. And secondly, I want you to get permission to get some of those rare mixtapes and hand it off to, um, you know, brother, um, Dewan B or get a copy or something. That information needs to be told, brother. All right, peace and love. Hey, peace, yeah. Sister Mary. Well, I appreciate, appreciate it, you. Man, but I don't want the responsibility for the tapes. Now the brother could dub a tape for me, and, and I said and, dub. Did what? Yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah. If he could dub it for me, <laughs> hell yeah. I don't want them original. Hell no, nah. I ain't. My insurance ain't that good. <laughs> but I think Mrs. Zell, she's gone. She sleep for the night. Um. But I appreciate y'all for listening. 
Um, I'm, I'm going to upload this over, over on YouTube so you can get the copy of it. But please go to DeWanB.com right now and register for my live stream uh, pay-per-view. Uh, you just, you'll get a copy of it, of the extended version. But we now we're going to have a conversation. And you'll be able to ask me questions based off what you see. And if it's something I say in the documentary that you need clarification on, or you want deeper understanding, I'll be able to expound upon things. Um, your attendance to the live stream pay-per-view is going to help fund the full long season of It's Bigger Than Hip Hop, the Black American Music Family Tree. Uh, follow me on YouTube at Dewan B. Um, and like I said, there are no perfect messengers. Only perfect messages for those willing to pick up the game. Before you go, Brother Dewanbi, please yeah. um give the date. Oh, yeah, I appreciate that. Me. Yes. Um, November twelfth, Sunday. Um, that will be the end of night six. The the extended version is about thirty five minutes. It's a short. It's not the full length. It's a short, but it's it's very detailed. And in that thirty five minutes that I that we have of this, I can teach a semester long course just off that thirty five minutes. It's conceptually dense, um, but it's an intro to where we're going because it's gonna get much deeper from here on out. But the pay-per-view is a fundraiser. The whole point of it, the pay-per-view, is to raise funds to get the full-length season in so we can really get detailed. And I'm going to do multiple seasons of this. All right. So uh, get all that shit at DeWanby.com. Miriam, I appreciate you. Racer bro. Everybody that spoke, I appreciate y'all. Everybody has some intelligence to say. I thank y'all for keeping the energy of my of my Twitter spaces high. And not coming around with that bullshit. Because I ain't here for that bullshit. I'm just here to pass along the information. And do it with, with love and shit talk. Because I like talking shit too. Alright. But even in my shit talk is love. Even for you niggas with. Even for you Puerto Rican niggas. I love y'all too. Just understand Puerto Rican niggas. There's nothing hip hop. About niggas with Kid Ray mullets. And shags. And roll ARs. If you roll your R's, you ain't hip hop. I ain't never heard a nigga say or anything unless he's imitating the tech nine going off. So the only time you're gonna hear a nigga roll his R's in hip hop is if he's making the sound of an AK forty seven automatic going off. A nigga's never gonna say Rodriguez in hip hop. And you Puerto Rican niggas with the with the mullets looking like Kid Ray from Lean on Me, y'all didn't create hip hop. And the same with you Jamaican niggas. Y'all wear white jeans to Thanksgiving. There's nothing hip-hop about wearing white jeans and fake-ass Versace shirts. You didn't create hip-hop, Jamaicans. You cannot create hip-hop. And you niggas are still wearing the green bottle of Polo Ralph Lauren cologne. Who the fuck still rocks the green bottle of Ralph Lauren Polo, Jamaicans? So you're not hip-hop. And Nigerians don't even try it. You niggas wear stonewashed jeans and tuxedo shirts. And you ain't never seen a bottle of lotion that you've connected with. Like, niggas, we ain't, I ain't saying niggas is prissy. But black Americans, we got black American women. And black American women don't let us walk out the house with ashy ass knuckles. So if you come from a culture where ashy ass knuckles is accepted. Nigga, you black, but your hands is gray. You ain't hip hop. Let's make that very clear. Because black women do not allow ashy ankles, ashy knuckles. And a lot of you niggas come from ashy knuckle environments. Look like you've been punching cinder blocks. If your hands look like you've been punching cinder blocks, and you've been building sandcastles and all you did was wake up, then no, you ain't hip-hop. Because a black woman would never allow knuckles at ashy in her home, in her dwelling. So you ain't hip-hop. All right?
Let's make that very clear. My name is Dewan. I appreciate y'all. I'm out.